So yeah, I think I'm doing good. Good. Nice meeting you. Well, nice meeting everyone. I, I got to give you a lot of credit for those of you who are um, speaking sounds like English as a second language or a third language, whatever it is, because I can't imagine how difficult that is walking into another country and just trying to find your way. So when you're looking for the right word, I mean, I give you so much credit for the effort you guys make. And you guys sound great. I mean, it's I don't know what I do if I was in your country <laughs> doing this. I'd be really struggling. So good for you. Well, I'll get started. So I'm going to try to, um, we don't have a remote, so I'm going to try to control from over here and try to walk over there. I want to be engaging. Um, remember, engagement is is a two-way street. If you get engaged, you're engaged. But the person you're engaged to is also engaged. So it goes both ways, right? So I do want to be engaging here. I want you guys to contribute if you want to, ask questions. Um, if I say something too fast, sometimes I talk too fast, especially for those of you who um, can't catch up with the English language. So please just slow me down. Um, I just want to do this for your benefit, not for mine. So whatever I can do to make it easier, better, clearer, just let me know. One caveat, um, I will tell you that when I was younger and I used to go to see someone lecture or speak and so forth, and they did a PowerPoint presentation and they would constantly hit through, hit through, hit through, and they're talking and reading the screen. I used to get so annoyed because, well, I can read the PowerPoint, I don't need you. Uh, until a few years ago, I actually went to a lecture and this woman was fantastic and she had everything up on the screen as I'm talking about, but she was adding color and life to everything she was talking about. So that is what I'm going to, going to try tonight. Um, I don't want to bog you down with too much information up here, but it does help the conversation go and especially with any kind of language barriers. It might be easier if you're reading things and hearing at the same time. So that's what I'm going to try to do and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So my right, first trick. Does this work? Uh, oh, I got to go for the answer button. Oh, just enter. Nice. See how special that is now? That was me. I did that. I am not a tech guy, but I tried to have a little fun with this. And that's, that's about the most extreme you'll see. Um, you guys are in a class called Managerial Consulting Projects. I'm sure you all know that, right? So um, that is a business course. And that is something that uh, I don't know if it's a prerequisite for you guys or if it's an elective. Um, but it sounds like, from what many of you have said, and I've, and I've heard, um, that you're getting a lot out of the class. This is one of those classes to me that's very practical, very, you know, um, it's not just learning. You know, I was an accounting major, so I can make fun of accounting. Accounting, you learn a lot of rules, a lot of, you know, debits on the left, credits on the right, blah, 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 blah. This is the kind of class that you really have to kind of expand your mind and get out of it, you know, what you can personally. That's why I've always loved classes like this. My favorite, favorite class in college um, was management, behavior, and the organization. So I think someone was a social, um, uh, sociology major, someone said, or, and yeah, um, I loved it because there's so much psychology and sociology in this management behavior. Um, outside from my accounting classes, it was the one that stayed with me all these years because it really taught me the dynamic of how a business works. I took three classes in it, loved it. Um, when you get to the working world and you understand how the working world works, it's different. And you guys have all sampled it already. It's different than what you might imagine in a classroom or see on TV. Um, yeah, it's cutthroat, but it's also, there are great people out there that you guys are going to work with and interact with. And those relationships, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, the relationships are really key and really important. And, and the dynamic between you and all these people is critical to your success and your happiness. So just keep all that in mind as you guys kind of move forward. That was all off the cuff. So let me get back to my presentation. So do we all know who this guy is? Jonas Gilman Clark, anybody? He was a son of a farmer, prominent businessman, entrepreneur, and he founded Clark University in 1887. You guys ever heard of him? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't until uh, this morning when I was putting that slide up. Um, just holding his name down. Yeah. yeah. No, it is, great. So um, that's great. He's a businessman. And I think what I want to do here is talk a little bit about myself and my background. So I want to give you a sense beyond what I just told you, sort of who I am. So what I learned as a child. Now, don't worry. Don't get too uptight with learned as a child. I want you to think we're going to be here for six hours hearing about my life story. We're not doing that. But see that second line, entrepreneurship, resourcefulness, and relationship building? I learned those as a child. That might sound kind of strange to you. I didn't know I was learning them, but when I look back in my life, 
I learned them and I learned them from my dad in the first two and my mother on the third. Um, my mother was, talk about relationship building. She was the sweetest person in the world. She was endear herself to everyone. She was always selfless and always giving. And so I definitely grabbed a lot of that from her. And I, I try anyway. And I don't think I measure up totally, but I got a lot of that from her. My father was not like that. He might be the opposite, um, but he taught me entrepreneurship and resourcefulness, especially the resourcefulness. It's a key word. It's a really important concept. Being resourceful is going to get you so far. That's my secret to success because honestly, I think that um, good grades are fantastic and knowing the right people and getting into good companies with good names and so forth, but understanding how to problem solve and be resourceful and not always looking and saying, I can't do this. Can you just figure that out? Or call this guy, he'll fix it. I'll call that woman. It's not about that. Try, try really hard to be resourceful. Try to fix things yourself. You know, dig into problems because you will learn so much by digging into problems. You'll just, you'll expand your mind like crazy. So that's what I learned as a child. Um, moving along to college, I went to Bentley University, which was Bentley College at the time. It's in Waltham, Massachusetts, not too far from here. It's a business school. Um, and I was an accounting major there. And, um, you know, it took a lot of flack for being an accounting major. And I still do because people make fun of accountants. Because, you know, we're all, you know, stiff and, you know, un unbending and so forth. It's not true. I'm, I'm definitely bending. Um, I had a good experience there. I told you about my experience with management be in behavior in the organization. And it was fantastic. And my accounting classes were fantastic. And uh, you made me think of something. So when I graduated college, I got a job at, at the time, they were called the Big Eight Accounting Firm. Now they're the Big Four Accounting Firm. But back in the day, it was the Big Eight Accounting Firm. They were the eight largest accounting firms in the world okay huge accounting firms and they all came to our campus every year and recruited people and it was hard you know, it was a you know kind of a cutthroat process trying to get an interview with them and then getting a job and i was lucky enough in my first semester senior year uh to get a job at pete mark at the time it was pete mark now they're like oh, anyway. um but pete mark was one of the big accounting firms and i was so excited because at Bentley, when you're an accounting major they gear everything towards public accounting and being a CPA, working in the big eight. And while they did that, I'm not sure if I realized what it all meant. I'm not sure if I realized what I do when I actually went to work. And that's kind of what I'm telling you guys. Really try to look hard at what you're doing. And don't just take everything as it comes. Question things. Make sure you understand. So I got this great job at a great company, right? It lasted six months. Six months. I hated every day of it. Starting on my resume because I it was so insignificant. I hated every day of it. It was ticking in time. It was going from one customer to another, trying to figure out. It was so disorganized to me. It was just this is the most boring job I can imagine having right now in my life. And I'm not sure if I would have left, but I met a buddy of mine in the street in Boston at lunchtime. He worked at a tower right across the street. He said we're hiring. It's a commercial real estate company one of the biggest in New England. They actually built a lot of the skyscrapers in New England back in the 70s and the 80s. He said, we're, you know, we're interviewing, watch come over. You can be what I am, like a you know, first year accountant for a commercial real estate company. I did, got a job. The rest of history. I was there for seven years. The reason I'm mentioning that is because sometimes you really think one thing is your path and one thing is it. The big name, go after the big name, go after the Goldman Sachs, go after Morgan Stanley, go after, you know, Pete Mark. It's not always the best thing. You know, I look at the route I took, I skipped the big eight, and I had a lot of success in my career. I would not be here today if I had taken that path. I may just be as successful, right? It would have been a different path, different kind of success. But don't think that just because you get a job in a company you may have never heard of is somehow a step back or not a good thing, because it's not. And as long as you're willing to learn and interact and, and develop relationships, it can be such a beneficial thing for you. So I am proof of that. So that's the only reason I thought of it is because, as you said, you know, you were thinking, do I do this or do I, you know, do I keep looking for this or do I, yeah, spread your wings, look at other things, you know, look at what's best for you. First real estate company for seven years. After that, I worked in my family's business. So I need to go back and tell you a little bit about my dad. Um, my dad's story is pretty interesting. Uh, let me do a commercial break here. A lot of, you know, most of you are from different places, different countries, different cultures, right? 
So a lot of what I'm saying here, you're going to understand and be able to take back with you. And a lot of it might be different from what you might be used to. So I recognize that. And if anything that I say sort of sounds strange, just stop me and tell me because it's it's different cultures are definitely different when it comes down to, you know, especially I'm going to explain something from like 50 or 60 years ago. Okay. Things were very different back then. So that's my commercial brain. Mm -hmm. My dad uh, was not college educated. He graduated from high school, um, quickly joined the military during the Korean conflict. Uh, he was in the military for, I don't know how many years, three, four or five years. Um, when he got back from the military, college was not in, he was one of six kids in his family, no money in the family. They used put rope around their pants to keep their pants up because they couldn't afford belts. That's, that's kind of the type of family he was growing up in. So he came back. Again, he's resourceful, right? So he went out and got some jobs, gathered some money, and he bought an old truck. Just an old truck, a clunker. And he talked to his mother. His mother, Italian woman who was a great cook, right on the boat from Italy. She taught him how to make dough. He outfitted the truck with pizza ovens. He learned how to make pizza from scratch. He made pizza every day. He made the dough in the morning, let it rise, cut it all up, got it all ready. And he would drive the truck to wherever he possibly could to sell pizza around dinner time. He went to the projects. He went to the Coast Guard base in Boston. He went anywhere he possibly could. So this was may have been the original food truck, right? We're all used to food trucks now. Okay, back then there weren't food trucks. This is my dad. He did it. Maybe some other people may have been doing it across the country or the world, but it was not a common thing. And I felt kind of strange growing up because people said, you know, what do you do? My dad has a pizza truck. I'm like, what's a pizza truck? It was really a strange concept. So he did this, and here's the job. He eventually, he kept testing things. Well, what's the best time to go out? Where do I go? You know, who's buying my pizzas? My pricing okay? All those things we learn in, you know, college and MBA programs, right? But he was doing, practically speaking, trying to understand his business model. He finally got the idea to go to MIT, not to enroll in MIT. Now, Mass Institute of Technology is one of the premier engineering schools in the world. It's a great school very difficult to get into. Some of the geniuses of our time and his time have gone there um, and will continue to go there. He would bring his truck to MIT. He got special permission and he would go at night. MIT is located in Cambridge, okay? It's on the Charles River, which is beautiful. It's right down the street from Harvard University. But MIT is actually most of it, the back of it is along and in Central Square in Cambridge. Central Square is a cool place if you ever go there right now. But if you went there back in the 1960s, it was a dangerous place to go. If you walked into Central Square with maybe one or two of your buddies at nighttime to get a pizza or something, you may not come back or you might come back looking a lot different. It was just a very dangerous place. So my father put two and two together. The kids at MIT were studying till two o'clock in the morning. There were so many brainiac kids there. They were just, they were, they were burning the midnight oil every night. He brought his truck there, got permission. He went from dormitory to dormitory. As soon as he pulled up, they would ring the bell in the dormitory and kids would run down to the truck and order pizza because they couldn't get pizza if they walked out. It's not like today where you can, you know, call and get pizza, uh, food delivered. Didn't happen back then. They basically didn't eat unless they had something in their room from that morning, okay? So this is what he did. He raised his family. You now my mom didn't work. She was a stay-at-home mom. He sent three of us to college and my brother ended up working with him after high school. So when you think of what he did, the entrepreneurship that he kind of displayed, the, um, the resourcefulness, I mean, the stories we heard growing up and we all worked on the truck with him. So we were on vacation, he would take us to MIT. It'd be exhausting that time of night. It was so fun. All the kids that would sit in the truck, hang out, they would talk. They would, it was really quite an environment. So that's how my father made his business. He was a true entrepreneur. I call him a blue collar entrepreneur. Not the type that you see, you know, in, these, in the skyscrapers. He was a blue collar entrepreneur. He did it um, really from the ground up. And he taught me a lot uh, from there. So my family business. Seven years in commercial real estate. I was kind of growing tired of it. I liked it, but I was like, eh, I could use a change. My brother got sick. My brother was partners with my father since he graduated high school. And my father was aging. My brother was really kind of doing most everything, not everything, but most everything. They had gone from the truck. They were kind of still doing the truck a little bit, but they actually started managing a cafeteria, food service, in a corporate office building in Boston. My brother got sick. He was diagnosed with cancer. He went through treatments. 
he's still alive, he's retired, he's healthy today, so no, no, no bad ends here. But their business suffered, it's only two of them. And the one who's doing most of the work really can't be in every day. So I made a decision to leave uh, commercial real estate and work in my family business, um, just to kind of help you know, connect you know, from A to B once he was healthy. It turned into, once he was healthy and coming back, it turned into something pretty exciting for me because I kind of learned how it was to be an entrepreneur and work in my own business. It was our family business. And I put in an accounting system, which, you know, of course I put in the accounting system. They, they used to kind of do it, you know, money in, money out, that's about it. Do your tax. They just didn't know what they were doing. So an accounting system, uh, a marketing plan. Uh, I went and did a whole new menu with them. We kind of figured out the catering aspect, how we can do catering. They had Italian kitchen on wheels, right? That's what they called. So they had the truck, right? So they'd use the truck for catering and now they, they're on wheels doing it. Um, we once we kind of got up and running, I went out there and I got four new locations and four more office buildings. We hired 20 people. It was it was starting to grow and started to really flourish. And it was exciting. I was there for five years until I got totally sick and tired of working with my family. I love them, but it's difficult. If any has anyone worked with family, I think I think uh, you, you have. So it's hard. It's a hard dynamic. It doesn't mean anyone's bad. It just means that sometimes it's too close too often. And so uh, I was done. I accomplished, I thought I accomplished a lot with my family. It was a great experience. And I said, time to go back in commercial real estate. Commercial real estate pays a lot of money. I am, I have a lot of experience. I have a lot of real world experience now. And I got an offer from a great company to manage seven office buildings in uh, Marlboro, which is not too far from here, that Fidelity was occupying at the time. And for me, that was a big step up to manage, manage my own kind of office complex. Until my recruiter called me and said, can you take one more interview before you accept the job? I said, why? This is great. He said, I said, it's commercial real estate. He said, no, 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 it's uh, wealth management. And I said, well, okay, what do I know about wealth management? I didn't know what wealth management was at the time. I didn't know anything about wealth at the time. And uh, he said, just take the interview. So I went online. Now this is 1999. When you went online in 1999 to look at on the website, it wasn't very exciting. What you got was from them was a screen and it was all green, it's kind of like bank green, really ugly with Bank for International Investors, that's the name of the company. And it said, if you're applying, click here. Otherwise, that's it. <laughs> I mean, not even a phone number to add, but that was their website. Um, so they were not technologically savvy, but the company would. I went to that interview and left the interview, that first interview, saying, I got to work here. This is where I want to be. I found the place I want to be. Again, you know, it's it's not the route I thought I was supposed to take. I, I thought I was going to make millions in commercial real estate because I knew it. I was good at it. And suddenly I took another turn in my career. And I said, yeah, let's, let's go work in wealth management. I got a job there as the CFO and eventually became COO. It's a smallish company, okay? So when I say smallish, um, when Sam started the business, and I'll tell you a little more about Sam and how he started the business in, 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 uh, later on when we do our case study, but um, he managed about $9 million in assets for high, three high net worth families. Now, we all might say $9 million is a lot of money, but when you're in business, when you're Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, I mean, nine million is uh, a rounding error. That's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. That's where he started his firm. By the time I joined, he was up to about 250 million in assets under management. And by the time we sold the firm, fall 3120, just about a year and a half, two years ago, it was 1.5 billion in assets under management. And honestly, in all that time, we didn't really change a whole lot. We really we kept up with what's going on. Our technology became much better, much better than that website. Um, but you know, we 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 kind of stuck with all the core things that made us strong. And the biggest thing was relationships. So relationships are really core, what are core to the wealth management business because you know wealthy people don't hire you just because you get good returns. They hire you because they trust you. And if they can't trust you, it doesn't matter what the returns are, you're gone. They'll fire you. But when they trust you, even if you returns you know waiver, you know, this is a bad quarter, but you know, they don't fire you for that. They really don't, unless things are extreme, of course. They fire you because they can't trust you and there's no relationship. So again, keep that relationship in mind. And as I move on, wealth management, companies, bank books, national investors, wealth management firms, you'll hear a lot about bank books tonight. 
as I move forward. All right, exciting. Who is, let's see. Uh, who's this guy? Anybody recognize him? Socrates. Socrates, right. I always find it strange because I don't think he was blind, but it looks like he doesn't have eyeballs in this statue. <laughs> but um, yeah, Socrates was um, a pretty famous philosopher, right? And according to Wikipedia, and it's in Wikipedia, it's the internet, so it must be true. Wikipedia says Socrates was a, was a Greek philosopher who was credited as the founder of Western philosophy and among the first moral philosophers of the ethical tradition of thought. So Harry, I'm talking about business, and I told you guys how Mr. Clark was a businessman before he started this, and I'm in business, and we're all talking about a business class here. Why in the world am I talking about Socrates and morals and ethics? Hopefully, you know I'm talking about that stuff, but um, bear with me. One of the most famous things Socrates is known for is, to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. Has anyone heard that before or a variation of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not uncommon, but it's so deep and so important. He said, an essential part of knowing yourself must be recognizing the limits of your own wisdom and understanding, knowing what you do genuinely know, and knowing what you have yet to learn. So know what you know, but know what you don't know as well. It's just as important. But knowing yourself is critical. The unexamined life is not worth living. Sounds extreme, doesn't it? What he's trying to say is, if you don't know yourself, how are you going to get to know other people? And if you don't know other people, how are you going to have success in life and in the workplace? If you really don't understand what's motivating people and, and, and causing them to do what they are doing when they're doing it, how are you ever going to figure out and understand where you fit in and how you fit in? So it all starts with you. It all starts with each one of you to really understand who you are, understand what your limits are, and understand what you don't know. Because what you don't know, you got to figure out, be resourceful, or you partner with people who do know. And that's really critical as well. Okay, does anyone know who the guy on the right is? A lot of people are not from the United States. Who is it? Bill Belichick. So Bill Belichick, for those of you who are not um, from the United States, um, the game of football, you've heard of football? You, uh, uh, um, American football, different than it's not soccer football, it's American football, funny shape ball. So Bill Belichick is the, um, is the um, head coach uh, of the New England Patriots, who are right down in Foxborough. And for the last 22 years or so, they had a phenomenal amount of success. They had the best quarterback in the history of the game playing for them in Tom Brady, man, for that name. Um, he is known, he is arguably the best U.S. football head coach of all time. And even his enemies will probably say the same thing. So he's a pretty serious guy, serious dude. And this is what I kind of found interesting. So this Socrates and this Belichick, don't they kind of look alike? I mean, seriously. <laughs> if, if, if Bill had a beard, right, and Socrates had eyes, look at the noses, the jowls. They look pretty much very similar, don't they? So maybe Bill Belichick is today, uh, today's guru. This is what Bill Belichick says. Put away your social media and put your energy into building relationships. Sounds like an old fogey, right? Okay, social media is good. We all use social media. I do. We all do, okay? He doesn't. He makes fun of it, whatever. But social media really works for him because people using social media are on his behalf. What he's really trying to say is true, though. We can't just live in social media. We have to live amongst each other. This, we have to be in front of each other. I taught a similar class like this last semester over Zoom. And it was great, but I did not get to know those folks nearly as well as I know you guys right now. Like at this very moment, I feel more connected with you as a group than I did to that group just because we're here in person. So what he says is, Put your energy into building what he calls real relationships. Success from co comes from relationships with people you know personally, not from strangers who you like on social media, online. You've heard all this stuff before. Here we go. Belichick traces his own career achievements to the many coaches, analysts, players, and others in his sport that he took the time to know authentically. Real, you know, real, not just over the internet, not just... I know someone who knows someone. I know a guy who knows a guy. He really got to know them. Now, when you notice personalities like he's not, doesn't seem like a very friendly guy. He hates the media, so he's always he's really crass in front of you know cameras and so forth. But in real life, he has standards. And this is a big thing for him, really, getting to know people and getting people to know him and understanding 
what's the system like? How do you do it? Let's try to incorporate it. So it's key. He is he's an incredible football mind with a lot to learn. So here we are now in our class. So here we are in our class. And the question is this, why did I spend, I don't know, about a half hour, I think I just talked, 20 minutes to a half hour, mostly talking about my life, ethics, morals, Socrates, American football, Bill Belichick. It sounds like it has nothing to do with this class, right? So do me a favor, someone tell me what you hope to get out of this class. What, what do you think the value of this class is this semester? Anybody, don't be afraid. What do you think you're gonna get out of this class? Um, I mean, it's kind of like what I've already gotten out, but I think that undergrad or just I don't know, college in general, it does such a good job of you know giving you a list of classes that you just develop tools. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I'm sure if you can count, you can relate to that. You need certain classes to build onto each other, and then you know ultimately, then you get to really harness the power of Excel, right? Like you, you, right. you know everything builds up to 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 one thing, and it's like, well, what is it building up towards? And I feel like you know now I have all these tools. This class is the playground, and and it's been a lot of fun being able to you know be in this class with everyone here, and everyone talk about their clients, and then it's like, oh, we all have different problems, but kind of the same solution, and we all kind of need each other to get to that solution, and it's been it's been a lot of fun, and I think that translates really well to just, you know, my whole entire kind of academic career. Yeah, I like that. I like that description, uh, especially the part where you're leaning on each other. You leverage other relationships with people and so forth, and it helps you try to figure out what that is that you're going to achieve. You know, where are you? What are you trying to get? Uh, where are you trying to get to? Uh, uh, as much as you guys might think, I don't think anyone has it figured out yet. I mean, I'm 57, and I'm still kind of trying to figure out what my purpose is in life, right? Um, you know, life keeps moving, keeps changing, it's dynamic, right? And you gotta change with it. You gotta figure out what you really want, where you're going, the people you're with, and the people you're with become so important. So my point to you is that Socrates talking about knowing thyself and Bill Belichick talking about relationships, I think it has everything to do with this class. It has everything to do with whatever business you choose to go into. And it's certainly got everything to do with my company and my entire career my successes okay and i hope as we get now back into talking about business i hope you'll see some of those themes kind of naturally come on I'll, I'll mention a few times but you'll see for yourself how re important relationships and understanding knowing who you are not just as a person but as a company you know really provides so much added value to you in your career so let's start here what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through a bunch of slides on ex exit planning um and then I'm going to do a case study, which is about my company. I'll tell you all about my company, the transaction. I'll tell you kind of how it came about. Um, and I'll tell you um, how we got to that ending point of selling the company in, in 2020. Sorry, 2020. Losing track of it. COVID really messed up everyone's schedules. And I can't think in the 1900s. Okay. Um, so let's just get uh, right into it. And hopefully that was a good precursor to what we're going to get to here. Before I start, any questions? That, is there anything you want to start with or anything that I said that you have questions on? Okay. If you guys have questions along the way, just raise your hand. I'm happy to stop, take questions, so please don't be shy. All right. So what we have here is an exit plan is a strategy. So think about what a plan is, an exit plan. You know, put it on paper. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start here, take all these steps, and then we're going to end up here. This is our final. Okay, that's a plan. But before you do a plan, you gotta have a strategy around what you're doing. So I always think about exit plans as really being exit strategies. And there's a lot of different strategies you can kind of incorporate. Um, but just think about that. An exit is, I'm starting my company today. What am I gonna do with it? Well, I think what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna do a couple of rounds of financing. I'm gonna take some partners on board. I'm gonna develop this project. And then Google's gonna buy me in five years for, you know, uh, $2.3 billion, whatever it is. Like, you know, you kind of have an exit in mind. Like what, when you start something, what do you hope to accomplish with it, right? Now, most people starting businesses make the mistake of not really doing that. They say, you know, my dad didn't do it. My dad said, uh, I don't know. Oh, I know, truck, pizza, I'll just do this. Like he wasn't thinking, how am I gonna exit someday? I'm gonna, you know, he was not thinking about monetizing his business and, you know, taking on partners and doing rounds of financing. He didn't know any of that stuff, right? For this day and age, all the people that you guys are going to bump into and you guys yourself, you guys are all going to be um, in a position to be trying to understand 
what your exit is for wherever you are. Even if you get a job somewhere, how long are you going to work there for? And what are you going to accomplish there? And then you're going to take it somewhere else and do something else, start your own business. I've heard a couple of people say. So think about an exit strategy as being your plan, your story. What's the story? What do you hope to accomplish? Where are you going? So I define um, an exit strategy as the ultimate goal of an owner, a group of owners. So think of any kind of owner. Transitioning a company from its current construct, whatever your company is, whether you're you just started it today or it's been it's 10 years old, whatever today's construct is of your company, what are you going to do if you're thinking about exit now between now and your next significant transaction? I say significant transaction because you, know, you might have some rounds of financing, you might take on some private equity money, but ultimately you're going to make an exit. Right, or your team's gonna make an exit, you're gonna sell, or you're gonna you know go public, or whatever it's gonna be. You know, that's what it is. What's the ultimate goal? That's my definition, by the way. You can look up exit plans, exit strategies, and get a hundred different definitions. This is my definition because that's how I think about exit plans and exit strategies. So types of exits, IPOs, right? Initial public offerings going public, sale to a third party. An M A transaction, private equity, strategic buyers, family, friends, employees. You know, in this country, something very interesting. Not good, but interesting. Let me tell you this statistic: thirty percent of small businesses. And by the way, most of you will work in relatively small businesses at some point in your life. Thirty percent of small businesses in this country that close up shop were successful at liquidation. So they didn't close a, a company that was doing poorly. They closed for another reason. I'm sick. Uh, I, I, I can't work anymore. I need to retire. Um, my family's putting pressure on me. And they don't know how to sell their company. It's too late. They, they don't have a plan. It's nothing. And they basically walk away from it, liquidate their assets, and then retire, right? Happens 30% of the time, about a third of the time, which is kind of crazy. Why? Because people are in their businesses and not projecting forward and trying to figure out what it is they want to do, how they're going to exit, what is their plan? 30% of people in small businesses don't have a plan. That's what that's really telling you. So you need a plan. You need to be thinking about this before you have to think about it. There are, um, bring that exit signs. <laughs> I think there'll be exit signs. Throughout this space, this, oh, that's probably like a smoke thing, whatever. Throughout the space, you're in a building, hopefully there's uh, this fire stuff in here, but you see exit signs in the building. They don't go up the day of the fire. Those would go up when the building is being built, right? You have a plan. It's an exit strategy if there's a problem, right? It's the same exact thing for your business. Now, if you're going to do it for you know everyday things like that, why aren't you doing it for your biggest asset, for your most important um, transaction of your life? So I'm going to take this. I'm going to use, um, I said, a lot of different ways of making an exit. I'm going to use sale of a company as my example to do all this. Remember, there's a lot of different things you can do besides selling a company, but I'm going to use sale of a company because it ties in with, you know, the case study I'll work on with uh, my company explains to you kind of what we did. Just makes the conversation a lot easier and smoother. So the big picture is the sale of the company, right? That's what we're talking about here. Selling a business. Okay. Who here has sold a house or a condo or a townhouse? or know someone like your parents or somebody who sold a house? Anybody? There's one, two, three, four, okay. So if you were part of that or you knew about it or you did it yourself, I think what probably did not happen is you didn't wake up one morning and say, hmm, maybe I should sell my house, yeah. And then you go put a for sale sign on the front lawn and you call a broker and say, can you list my house because I want to sell it? It really doesn't happen like that. What usually happens or what should happen is you start thinking about selling your house at some point in your life. And then you start preparing to sell your house. You say, you know what, in the spring, we're gonna sell. So between now and springtime, we need to clean the, you know, clean up that garage. We need to, you know, paint the, the bedrooms. We need to, you know, put a new countertop on the kitchen, get some landscaping done. You want to do things to increase the value of your house when you finally decide to sell. And by the way, what you do early on. You call that broker way early on before you're going to engage them and say, thinking about selling, walk through my house with me and tell me what you think I need to do to maximize the value of my house between now and springtime. And they will. They'll tell you what they think it's worth. They'll tell you if you do X, Y, and Z, it might be worth even more, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? That's an exit plan for selling your house. So anytime you're thinking about an exit plan or a, a company selling, think about 
selling a house, the real basic things about selling a house. Selling a business is like selling a house. And it's not forwarding, it's thinking. So I'm gonna give it a second. Then the last slide, say what's gonna happen next. Um, so selling a business is like selling a house. Hiring an investment banker is like hiring a broker. Right? An investment banker is gonna help you sell your business. Investment bankers do a lot of things, but that's who you're going to call if you're trying to sell your business, okay? Investment bankers, um, if it's a house, you're going to call your broker. Same kind of thing. Um, the last thing, I should have memorized all this stuff. Yeah, and I, I, I have my laptop. I need my laptop too. Uh, so uh, I'll just I'll talk for you. The point here being is a lot of practical things that enter into the workplace that you just have to use your brains and just use your logic. Logic is so important. Try to find something to you know compare it to. Try to find something that says, yeah, this is just like that. Let me try to like, you know, walk in that those shoes for a while and see what happens. So uh, elements of an exit plan, selling a house, that's great. I really don't remember what I'm saying. So I'm gonna take my laptop out. You wanna just uh, give me a couple of, one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is contingency plan. This is a contingency plan. So I knew Tom had a computer. I sent in the PowerPoint and I said to myself, what if something happens? So I brought my laptop and I didn't just bring my laptop. But I downloaded the PowerPoint to my desktop so that I didn't need the internet. How's that for me? Outside the box. So I'm stopping here. Anyone have any questions? This is going to fire up really quickly. Anyone have any questions? Why am I pushing that? It's your turn. I don't get it. So I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So what time is the best? What is the best time to sell your company? Great question. That's a really good question. So you'll see as we get into the presentation. Mm -hmm. Um I'm gonna say it depends a lot today, right? It depends on so many things, but it's a critical question, right? So it depends on the type of company you have, right? Are you a seasonal company or you know? Because sometimes your, your company is seasonal where um, in the holiday season, you make a lot more money. So let's you know pad our numbers right before we sell. It's, it's going to look the best. It depends on the type of company you have. It depends on the industry you're in. It depends on what sector that industry is in. It depends on a lot of different factors. So um, obviously you want to sell when the market's going, right? It is healthy or right before it starts going down, really is when you want to sell. But no one really knows when it's about to go back down. We sold at a great uh, we were really fortunate to sell at a really good time because our business, um, our industry was just soaring up. So the um, the multiples, remember multiple is when you're talking about selling a company? So when you're selling a company, people talk about multiples, meaning um, a multiple of profit or a multiple of EBITDA. EBITDA is, EBITDA is earnings before uh, income tax, appreciation, amortization, whatever. It's profit, okay? So a multiple of profit. So I have a million dollars of profit and my multiple is five. I'm going to sell my company for $5 million. It would take the buyer about five years to kind of make back their investment, right? It's very simplified what I'm trying to say here. Um, but the multiples are really critical. So in good times and healthy times, those multiples tend to go up and the value of your company is going up. And that's what we kind of saw. It was, it was, they were both going up at the same time. Value of um, uh, wealth management firms and the multiples, and we hit it at a perfect time where we just maximized. Um, then we sold 12, 31, 20. So we sold our company during COVID from our living room. So in my living room, we're in my slippers and I'm selling uh, a multi-million dollar asset, right? Um, it was very strange, but here's the critical thing. We chose to sell the company, so I'm getting into the case study rule. We chose to sell the company in late 2019. None of us heard, about COVID, no one knew what COVID was at that point. Um, by the time first quarter of 20 came, COVID hit, everyone was sent home. Our technology, did it work? Yeah, it worked great. So that's that's what I said. We really developed our technology pretty well. Everybody worked remotely. Um, it was all well and good. But we were so scared during that time because timing is everything. We thought we were hitting the perfect, everything's going up, this is great. And as people are, and, and the markets, by the way, took a hit. Kind of early on, right after COVID, they took a big dive because they were really healthy, but then they correct they, they, they kind of started going back up again. So as it turned out, the entire stay-at-home thing in COVID didn't really affect us in a negative way. 
all the offers we're getting kind of understood COVID is going to come, but it's also going to go and things are going to normalize. And markets were still strong. And we were nervous about a lot of other things at the time. We were nervous because as we kept going into 2020, there were presidential, there's a presidential election coming up in November. Donald Trump was leaving the White House and Joe Biden's coming into the White House. And the dynamic of a Republican president leaving and a Democratic president coming in and the, the promises and effects that we thought were going to take place with taxes, because everyone, including Joe Biden, thought the capital gains rate was going to go skyrocketing, right? So if you sell your company in 2023, we thought instead of paying 15% cap gains, we might have to pay 30% or 40%. They, they were really talking about big increases. And luckily, when it came down to it, Joe Biden decided, I don't, I don't mean to say Joe Biden, the administration and the powers that be did not increase the cap gains standard. So we luck. So let me say this. We made sure we sold our company before 2023 because 2023 is when the taxes were enacted. So we sold on 12, 31, 20. So timing is everything, right? I just gave you all the reasons why timing is so important. But that's very specific to our business, our industry, our sector, and kind of what was going on in the world. So many things in the environment can really affect that. So great question. I, I have that. another question about yeah. the multiples. What decides the multiple now again? Was it only looking at no, but is it dependent on every brand? Yeah, so that's the same answer. Depends yeah. on the industry you're in, depends on you know kind of what the economic environment is. Um, Obviously, supply and demand are going to—it's going to dictate a lot of this stuff. Um, so, multiple sort of—I um, don't know how they ever kind of came up, but but think of it this way: if in my simple example before, um, my profit every year is a million dollars. If I sell my company at a five multiple, I'll sell it for five million. I walk away, and the new owners—they just spend five million. But they'll in the first five years, assuming nothing changes, they'll make. $5 million and their payback is a five year payback. And that's really simple and things aren't that simple in real life. But think about that as a five multiple. A lot of times the multiple is derived because it's all about payback. When am I gonna get my payback? When am I gonna, I'm gonna buy this company? It's gonna be profitable on buying the technology. Maybe it's not about profit yet. It's really about the technology, lay their technology and your technology and suddenly you're, you're screaming. But somehow, some way there's payback, right? And whatever that 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 payback time frame is, kind of dictates where your multiple is going to sort of start, and then you negotiate up or down. It moves, it changes. And here's the other thing: multiples can be tricky because when you say, "Oh, multiple of EBITDA," or I'll, I'll call it profit, multiple of profit. Okay, sounds straightforward. Are you talking about profit from the last calendar year, or are you talking about profit based on? next year's budget what it's going to be when you buy the company are you do forward looking three years and average it are you going to are you going to figure out your revenue based on your most current month the most current quarter and kind of extrapolate that there's so many different ways of doing that which makes the multiple apply to all those examples the same multiple will have totally different results than everything i just said so the multiples are circumstances yeah you can look at it that way i look at it like this i think multiples are a farce I really do. I think multiples are whatever you can figure out the multiple after you sell the company. I sold for this. This is my profit. The multiple was X. By the way, you get a multiple of revenue. There's a lot of other multiples. That's the most common is profit. But after you sell the company, it's a math equation, right? It just says um, how much I sold the company for divided by the profit equals the amount that we're right, the buy or something like that. Um, but when you're actually using the multiple negotiating, it's just a tool to get your price up. You know, once you say, you know, what you're fighting as a seller, you're fighting for forward-looking numbers because the markets are going up. So we fought for forward-looking uh, earnings, and they were fighting for no, do you last year, maybe the average of the last three years, whatever. And so you keep this kind of tug of war going. Multiple just dictates what you're in your mind you're throwing out there as a number. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Based on everything you're talking about. So you can say, okay, tell you what, um, we'll do the forward-looking five, you know, forward-looking year. Uh, but the multiple is only going to be, you know, 4.5 or something like that. Yeah, you, you kind of adjust your numbers. It's a farce in my opinion, but I think a lot of investment bankers might shoot me for saying that a lot, but that's that's my opinion of it. Um, so anyway, let's get back on track now. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so let's get back on track. Um, thank you for these questions. They're very helpful. Um, move on from buying a house. 
So you engage your investment banker. That's like your broker, okay? Determine the types of companies you be, that would be interested in your business. Who are your competitors, your strategics, private equity firms, family, internal sales. You, with the investment banker, are trying to figure out who finds me appealing. It's like dating, right? It's like, who's going to find you go to a dance or something? Who's going who's gonna to want to dance with me, right? You're trying to figure out who in the crowd of companies out there or people out there, who is interested in my company that I can really maximize my value and get the best sale price and put my, my customers and my clients in good hands. So that's, what, uh, that's one of the first things you're going to be looking at. Identify specific company and people who might have interest. Why would they acquire you, right? So what are their intentions? Because they just want your technology, your talent, your profit, what is it? How do you fit into their strategy? What are the synergies? Do you have something they need? Probably. And then you determine the enterprise value. Okay, I'm kind of flying through some of these and don't worry too much about a lot of these steps and details. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for it. But enterprise value is a big one. I'm gonna spend the next two or three slides on enterprise value. Um, Enterprise, the, the, the definition of enterprise value technically is a bit beyond how I'm explaining it today. I'm really talking about the value of a company. And in a small company, you do call it enterprise value, but it really applies very well when you're looking at, you know, um, IPOs and uh, 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 cost, of, cost per share uh, of a stock, et cetera, et cetera. You know, companies that are highly leveraged or companies that are, um, you know, have really big market caps. So I'm kind of using enterprise value in a, in a kind of casual way, if you will. But you get the point of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to keep all of our examples and conversations sort of simple so you understand the process, you know, and the items more than you're understanding, you know, how does this apply to every business? You'd be here for months trying to figure out how all this stuff applies to every business, okay? Um, so enterprise value, let me talk about that a bit. That's going backwards. That's a few more. We'll just throw the whole thing out there. All right. So, yeah. Okay. So, when you're trying to find out how you value your company, we were talking about multiples. Okay. Put the multiples aside. What's the value of your company? Look at your tangible assets. Look at your intangible assets. Um, tangible assets, you know, are things, you know, these are tangible assets. If I own it the car, the trucks, the equipment, whatever it is, those tangible assets. The intangibles are some of the stuff down the bottom. You have goodwill, um, you have a patent, you know, your intellectual capital, your, um, I'll get to this stuff later, relational capital, innovation capital. But these things all add a lot of value to your company. And once you understand what of all these things is really special, you've got to do that middle thing. Think of your key assets and metrics as drivers of value. So what is your key asset? Not necessarily physical, but what is your key attribute? What's your key metric? You know, what is it that you can say about your company that everyone else would drool over and say, wow, that's good. And then that's a driver of your value. So you drive that point forward, okay? You might even build your sale off of that, uh, that one thing or a handful of things. Um, down the bottom, intellectual capital, um, specialized knowledge, you have patents and trademarks and things of that nature, relational capital, uh, clients and customers, how close back to relationships now in our business. And I'll tell you more about how Sam started my business, but it was all about not transactions, but it was all about relationships with our clients. Okay. So those relational capital, if your clients are sticky with you, right. And a buyer comes in, that buyer wants to make sure that when they buy the company, those clients don't go elsewhere because it's easy to do so. They want to make sure you bonded with them and you're going to talk them into staying with the new people. In fact, you're going to stay on board for a couple of years and make sure it happens because that relational capital is really, really important. It's one of the most important things in valuing a company. Then innovation capital, value creation, organizational knowledge, you know, how you do things. You know, you might have a special process, a special way of um, kind of identifying your product and et cetera, et cetera. Just these innovative type things that make you special and make you different. So these are going to be more general topics. I'm just have general, general ways of thinking about valuations. Um, varies by company, industry, and sector. No one understands your key metrics, the economic environment around you. I'm saying this fast because we've kind of already been through this stuff, and, and I think you kind of know this stuff. Your specialties, your expertise, your patents, 
The competition, where do you fit in with the competition? Are you better or are they better? Supply and demand is always a factor when you're talking about buying and selling in this country. So those are kind of general things you think about when, when you talk about valuations. Now we get into the analytical. So if you're thinking about an analytical way of valuing your business, where do you think you start? You want to analyze your business, where do you start? What do you look at? Current financials. Current financials, okay. And your current financials are going to be your income statement, your balance sheet, and your statement of cash flow, your cash flow statement. Uh, it's a lot of different ways. So balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flow. Cash flow is critical, okay? Cash flow is the, this is my words, it's the lifeblood of your company. Cash flow statement shows how well the company is generating cash. It makes sense. It's kind of obvious, right? But it's so important because if you use any of the, those are the three most popular statements for companies to look at. There's plenty more, but those are the three biggies, right? If you use any one of those three statements, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow, if you use just one of them, you could be misled so badly. You might have a strong balance sheet and a strong income statement, and your cash flow might be ready to just fizzle up tomorrow. Okay. And all you could be cash, you could have plenty of cash, yet you're about to go this way with your profits because you know something just happened in the market and your your product is no longer needed. So so my point is you've got to look at all your financial statements. Cash flow is critical because nothing happens if you don't have cash. You can't pay your employees, you can't innovate, you can't pay your rent. Um, so the cash flow is really critical to stay on top of. Three things: the cash flow is going to be looked at from your operations, you know, cash flow for revenue coming in from your your sales and expenses going out just to pay the bills and to you know, develop your product and so forth. Um, cash flow from investments: what kind of investments is the company making, or who's making investments in you? And then financing, your debt service and so forth. So cash flow from each of those things gives you kind of three different ways of looking at your company. Um, from a health standpoint, I always think about a statement of cash flow as being like a, a health check on, you know, how healthy am I? It's a, it's kind of a, a quick and down and dirty way of uh, looking at it. Here's the direct and indirect method, uh, which I kind of think of it as a cash and a cool accounting. It's just two different ways of running a, a cash flow. Um, you come up with the same result. You just kind of start it from different places, different uh, uh, ways of getting there, but same result. I wouldn't really worry too much about it today. Um, and as, as I said, it's important for creditors, for investors, and for senior managers. Okay. Any questions on financial statements or cash flow or anything? Okay. How are we doing on time? We have it? How important is cash flow for small business? It's probably more important for small business. Good. So in a small business, uh, let's say you have, you know, 10, 10 employees, you know, you're an electrician, you have 10 employees, um, it's you and 10 people. Um, obviously you need to pay them every two weeks, right? Or every week, depending on what kind of schedule you're on. Um, if they're on health benefits, you got to be paying a lot of money for their health benefits and dental and all that other stuff. Workers' comp insurance, all the other expenses, uh, putting gas in your van. So if you don't have any cash, right? You got to start using, yeah, right? Credit cards. Everyone goes to the credit card is the first thing they do. Uh, and a big company, they just go and call their bank and say, I need a loan, you know? And there's so many different ways of generating, uh, generating cash. But, you know, Debt is probably the most common way in the, the first place people kind of go. The other way is you can, you know, maybe bring in some investors. You know, you kind of sell portions of your company for cash, and now you have partners, you have, you're flooded with cash, and now you have to use that to really expand and grow so that you don't get into that problem again. So it's critical. As, I, I say it's more in a small company because small companies don't have as much leverage. They don't have as much reputation for actually getting that loan. Big companies often, you know, once you're big, you've already maintained some serious relationships out there and, you know, kind of figuring out who is going to kind of bail you out is going to be, I don't know, I don't want to say it's going to be easier, but there's a lot more options when you're a larger company. The reason why I'm asking is because last week we had a quiz on this and you just uh, told me everything I didn't find. <laughs> Well, I might be wrong, and you might be right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, let me know. I mean, I, I wrote stuff about that, but uh, yeah. not in detail about I'm glad you said that. Um, a couple of times tonight, I said, hey, this is my definition. This is the way I look at it. Right? I am one person who is, uh, had a business education and was in the business world for 30, I don't know, think about that, 35, 37 years, right? Um, and had a lot of success along the way. I had some failures along the way, a lot of difficulties along the way, but ultimately I had a lot of successes, okay? I'm sharing with you one person's viewpoint 
and really opinion, but it's educated opinion on what all this really means in a practical way. So you might hear people with a differing opinion or a different approach. You might hear people say, oh no, small business, you can easily get a loan to get a credit card, piece of cake, no problem. At a big company, you have to go through hoops. There might be a lot of different people. I have a different perspective than a lot of people because I always look at things differently because I'm resourceful. I always look at things 12 different ways and trying to figure out the best way to do it. I'm very analytical. So anyway, my point to you is, I'm not telling you I'm right. I'm not telling you there's any fixed answer to these things. Hopefully, you had an exam. You may have, you may have, I, I, had, a, I had a class in school. I did a paper. It's a 20 page paper in my MBO program. And the professor was handing out the grades. And we had to do these you know, big case studies. There was a big case study. And I took this direction where I was going and how I was analyzing and how I was going to fix it, identifying all the problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's handing out the paper. He says, all right, Mark O'Keefe. I said, yeah, oh my gosh, what happened? He said, um, I disagreed with almost everything in here, but you got an A because you defended your points so well, okay? So I can BS a lot, okay? But honestly, your ability to come to a conclusion and defend it in a very educated type of way, again, will get you very far. You, you get to a point where you, you might realize you're wrong and, and it's okay. It's, I've been wrong so many times, it's not even funny. But you get to a point where you're wrong, but if you live your life just believing what everyone's telling you, just taking everything at face value, you might get taken to the cleaners, which is an expression here that says, people are gonna rip you off, <laughs> you know, they're gonna rob you. So anyway, so just try to think outside the box. So what did that work? Um, I got a name in that paper and that was exciting for me. Okay, so moving on from financials, um, I guess this, in, again, this kind of falls under the category of uh, financial statements, industry metrics and ratios, and you know, how you analyze your stuff. Um, what do they mean to your company? How do they measure up against the industry? That's really important. If you have a metric that you kind of like in your company, you know, like our, you know, a debt to equity ratio, whatever it is, like pick any, well, that's fine. You think it's really good and healthy, but what's the rest of the industry? Are you under the average for those things or are you over the average? You know, so you really have to understand where you fit in compared to your competitors and compared to the, in the industry. Uh, what's your debt and credit worthiness? We kind of touched on that a little bit. Uh, budgeting and forecasting. You know, someone wants to buy your company and looking at valuation. Yeah, they want to look at financial statements to see how you've been, but they also want to get a sense of what's going to happen next year. So if I buy you, what, what was your plan and where are you going? How have your budgets you know, correlated to your actuals each year? You know, accountants every month or every week are going to be looking at here's the budget, here's the actual why we have variance. And that's how you keep fixing and then you reforecast and so on and so forth. So budgets and forecasting, making sure they're realistic and not just a bunch of BS is really important. All right, then kind of wrapping up, I think this is the last value. Um, your growth history is really important. Do you guys know what top on annual growth rate is? Have you used that yet? Okay, so Kager is a really important formula. Um, if you use Excel, you can put in the Kager formula. It's pretty easy. There's like you know, three or four different variables, piece of cake, or you can use it on a financial calculator. Are you doing it by hand is, I'm not sure how you do it by hand, so I'm not that smart. Um, Kager is really important. So Kager is gonna measure um, things like your revenue, your profitability, um, and hold this here. It's going to measure a whole bunch of things, um, revenue, gross margins, net profit, uh, new and existing clients. It's going to measure all these things for a buyer or someone valuing you. And they'll usually do it three to five years. You can do it one year, two years. You can do it up to 10 years. But three to five years seems like a reasonable amount of time to look back, look at the last five years and say, how, did you, how was your revenue trending? And was it doing this or was it just erratic? You know? In net profits, are we kind of going up here? Are you bringing on new clients and, or is it just the existing clients and you really have not gone out there and really you know, brought in new clients? The 80-20 rule, you know what the 80-20 rule is? So typically 80% of a company's business comes from 20% of its customers. 80% of your revenues comes from about 20% of your customers. General rule, it doesn't happen to everyone, but that's pretty common, okay? And so if you're relying on a handful of big clients, if that handful of big clients or some of them left, significant amounts of revenue leave with them. If one of your small clients leave, it's not gonna be as you know, detrimental to you. So the 80-20 rule is important because if you start saying, 
about 90% of our revenue comes from 10% of our clients, you're really getting in the danger zone because what if there's only one or two big clients and everyone else is small and you're relying on that? If something happens to those relationships, you're sunk, you're out of business. So people buying your, your business and understanding, trying to figure out your value, they're going to be looking at um, how well you brought on new clients and new customers over the last three years, four years, five years. Kager is a, um, a formula that you plug other than variables in and it gives you uh, basically your, your percentages saying, yeah, we're up uh, 80% Kager on revenue. That's pretty good. You're really, you know, well, that's crazy here. Um, but, you know, if your Kager's and revenue is moving, you know, 15% a year, that's pretty good. Your revenue is trending up. You know, you're looking at trends. Trends are so important in understanding and trying to analyze uh, valuations and businesses and so forth. Um, I asked you what time before. What, what time? Quarter past seven? So we have till nine, right? Okay. So, yeah, I keep talking fast like I'm in a rush. Bio break. Yeah, yeah, you tell me when. We'll stop whenever you think. In fact, we should do the bio break right before they could say. So give me a couple more minutes and we'll do that. So gear up. Sorry, one more thing. Okay. So this slide, uh, I like it. This is me again. Foundational. Okay. I talked about value from a general standpoint. I talked about value from an analytical standpoint. Now I'm going to talk about value the way I see it as like sort of a uh, catch all smell test. You know, smell test inflation. A smell test is okay. I got all the analytics in, uh, like, like the game of baseball. Again, in this country, baseball is really big. And a lot of people would just they'll go to games and watch the players. And with their eyes, they're saying, that guy's a great hitter. And then someone else will say, yeah, but I'm looking at the analytics, and this is what his history has been. He's actually not a great hitter. He, he looked like a great hitter, but the fact of the matter is, from an analytical standpoint, he's not. So my opinion is, analytics are critically important. You've got to have the analytics. The analytics is analytics going to tee you up for success, right? But you also have to do the smell test. What do your eyes tell you? What does your gut tell you? So I kind of look at that as a foundational kind of thing. How good is the foundation of the company that you're trying to value? A poor foundation cannot sustain great analytics. I would like to tell you that's an old saying, but I made that up, okay? A poor foundation cannot sustain poor analytics. And this is what I mean. Let's go back to the house sale. Uh, let, okay, let me go back to the house sale. Um, Let's say you're building a house, brand new house, multi-million dollar house using the finest materials, the nicest wood, granite countertops. You are, this thing is going to be the Taj Mahal. This is going to be a beautiful home, okay? But what you did, you didn't realize you built it on a foundation. They, they poured the concrete incorrectly or the, the chemical mix, you can tell me this, the chemical mix was wrong in the concrete, okay? And because the chemical mix was wrong, over the next five or 10 years, it's going to start to crumble. So how good is that house if it's on a bad foundation? Because eventually in five or 10 years, the thing's going to start crumbling down or maybe buying a house on a cliff. The ocean, how beautiful this is. Well, guess what? In 10 years, this cliff is not going to be here anymore because of erosion, right? So your foundation is critical. So when I talk about foundation, I am really talking about those things, those kind of smell test things. You've already been through the analytics. You kind of, kind of pass this muster. I want you to do this. Identify who the decision makers are, the senior management. What are their motivations? What are their goals? What's their vision, right? It's a big thing. That doesn't come out in your analytics. What are they, where are they going? What are they trying to do? Where's this headed? What's a critical thing to really understand? What's their corporate culture? Because if you're buying a company and their corporate culture is completely different from your corporate culture, it'd be disastrous, right? All the analytics in the world won't fix that. Which phase of their business life cycle are they in? So this a lot of different ways of looking at business life cycle. One of the kind of common one is you start as an entrepreneur, that's your startups, um, where a handful of people are wearing a lot of different hats and you know everyone's kind of doing whatever they can. Then you get to be kind of an enterprise where you're sort of like the, the entrepreneur isn't really calling all the shots because you have more process in place, right? And if eventually you mature where it's really about the company. The company is solid. You have employees, you have you know direction and so on and so forth. So depending upon which sort of life, part of life cycle your company is in, will have a lot to do with sort of how the analytics will play out. Yeah. Where did Banco sell on that? So we were in maturity at this point. And I'm glad you asked the question. I'm going to address that when we do the case study when I tell you about Banco. Um, I keep calling it a case study. We're not going to really figure anything out. But we're scared. <laughs> I'll tell you about it. I'll tell you about it as a case, but there's nothing we have to figure out. Okay. 
So I'm going to tell you about that more. That's a really good, uh, good question. We're just about a maturity, and I'll tell you why we, why, why I can tell you is maturity versus uh, enterprise. We were well beyond the entrepreneur, I thought. Even though Sam, as the founder, still had uh, his foot in everything, but that's a different story. So, phase with the slides later. So I call this a holistic approach. Um, we need to use active listening and engagement. I talked about engagement when we started tonight, right? So active listening is really listening to the people you're interviewing, the decision makers, senior management, and so forth. Active listening is when they're talking, don't be trying to figure out what your next question is. Be listening to their answer and engage them. If you don't really understand it, ask them more about it. Ask them to be clear, right? That active listening is going to give you a huge education. So make, make sure that's the case. Then entrepreneurs, okay? I have one, Sam. Um, they're a unique breed. If we have time at the end, I'll talk about entrepreneurs. I have a slide on it, but if we have time at the end, but they are a unique breed. So you need to, when you're interviewing an entrepreneur, you've got to really understand how to interview them to make sure you're getting everything you need to get because they are salesy. And they met them last week. Oh, uh, Ben. So Ben was great salesman, right? <laughs> yeah, ben, right? So he could sell uh, English, uh, an ice cream or an Eskimo, whatever. I mean, he's a good salesman, right? So if it's Ben, you can like say, okay, strip them of all the sales. Say, so tell, tell me, what is your plan for next year specifically? What do you like? You can just nail them down because they just they're idealistic sometimes, right? I mean, they're successful and they're great, but someone needs to ground them. So I'll get into that more if we have time uh, at the end. So I say sometimes you need to dig deep to reveal true intentions. And underlying motivation. Yeah. Would you say that this slide, which you're presenting here, has similarities with the ESG principle of uh, investing? Could. I mean, ESG is a type of investing for a purpose, right? Environmentally sound purpose, right? Like, yeah. Or social. Yeah, or social, yeah. So it has a specific purpose in mind. So if I was going to buy your company and you have an ESG platform as a big part of your investing platform, it'd be really significant. Um, do I buy into it? So I need to find out from you is why are you, why is that important to you? How do your customers really respond to that? Do they really want it? Um, it's great as long as it's making money, but what if the, the return started to hit? What if the performance went down? Are they really serious about the implications environmentally, right? Because sometimes when, sometimes people are gun-ho with social issues, but when it kind of meets them in their backyard, sometimes like, yeah, no. Right? So that's something you have to really delve into and see, you know, how strong is your client up? Is this something that's going to last in the future? So I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of what I'm looking at. That's kind of the G of the ESG. Right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, you know, I want to tell you something too. You know, I'm looking at, I'm um, doing a lot of this based on the transaction that we just had, because I know most about it, but I've spent probably the last 15, 17 years really studying exit planning and mostly for smaller businesses you know like i think about as a smaller business 1.5 billion dollars is a lot of money out of uh, you know under under management but it's small compared to morgan stanley and goldman sachs and fidelity and state street um so i've really got to know it and you get a, you kind of form opinions and you kind of say i find this to be very important and the next time i say eh, this is important that's okay you know what i mean so again, these are one person's interpretation of this stuff. But anyway, a lot of what you'll see here is really me. Um, it correlates to the, to the company that I just sold. All right, good. We're off evaluation, and we're about to wrap up here, I think. Um, understanding problem areas. So know thyself, right? Back to Socrates. You got to look at your house when you're selling it and say, yeah, the countertops are fast, the cabinets are chipping away. The landscape looks like crap, sweet though. It's just, you, know, you, you kind of know, you, have to, you can't walk around saying, no, to my house looks great, I love this stuff, fair enough, fair enough, whatever. Right? No, because when someone comes in, they're going to look at you differently than you're looking at yourself. And if you don't know how you look and your house looks, or your company looks, um, if you don't understand your real problems, then you're going to get caught at the sale time, right? Because they're going to come in and they're going to you know, look under the rugs and look on the closets and they're going to come up with a whole bunch of things that are going to bring your sale price way down. If you had just understood your problems ahead of time and you just put your ego aside and said, okay, let's deal with these, let's figure them out, let's fix them before we go to market, you're gonna have a much better valuation. So understanding your problem areas is critical. Um, how do you improve and solve for deficiencies? I kind of said, creating a detailed timeline, reverse engineering. So this is critical too, you know, um, if you're putting together a 
uh, an exit plan or an exit strategy, you might say, yeah, in 10 years, I want to develop our product. I want to have a couple of rounds of financing. And those rounds of finance are going to help us to develop sort of product two that are going to be on the heels of product one and blah, blah, blah. By the time we get to 10 years, I believe our company is going to look like this. And it's going to be worth this. And then that company is going to want to gobble us up for a ton of money, right? So if that's how you're thinking, do your timeline. Do a 10-year timeline, not reverse engineer. So if, if I know what I want to look like then, and I know what I look like today, as long as you're being honest with yourself, what's it going to take to get from here back? So you, you reverse it. You say, this is going to look like in year 10. So what do I need to be doing in year nine to make sure that's happening? What does year eight do to feed into year nine? You kind of go backwards and really develop and see sort of like, how many clients do I need? What's the pace of the clientele coming on board? Am I going to need to really get to that level of revenue in year 10? So reverse engineering on a timeline is really important. And it kind of makes you a lot more serious about your goal. Because when you do the timeline, sometimes you say, I ran out of time. It's really going to take 15 years, right? Because you, when you put it on paper, it's like, yeah, there's no way we're going to do that except for a couple of miracles. Uh, developing a contingency plan, like bringing your own computer just in case, you know, something, the internet's not good. But, you know, developing a contingency plan is hard. You know, like, did anyone have a contingency plan for COVID specifically? No, no one even knew what COVID was. But people had, you know, companies had contingency plans. We had one. We all went home on that Monday and the technology worked. That was our contingency plan is to have remote technology. And it worked. Um, even though you don't know exactly where all the threats are going to be out there, you have a sense on what kind of threats they could be. Sometimes they're, you know, from the competition. It could be your product. It could be a new innovation that came out that you never saw coming, and it's going to put you out of business to you. You've got to have some kind of contingency contingency plans. The most common types are for the senior management, you know, the partners, the owners, and so forth. So if if something happened to me, I had a contingency plan. If I get hit by a truck, um. There's a whole contingency plan on this is what I do in detail. And my boss knew where it was. I had keys to different things. I identified the keys. They were all locked up. And it pretty much said detail on this is what's important for the next person to really understand and take care of so that things don't fall through the cracks. So contingency plan is really critical. Um, every large company, you know, Bill Gates had a contingency plan. You know, people have contingency plans because um, one wrong, one wrong misstep or one wrong omission and it's like, wow, we just lost a whole lot of information and institutional knowledge that we are never going to get back. So we just lost two years of our progress, you know? So contingency plans are important. Know thyself. I'll say it again, Socrates. So um, the last slide, no, that was the last slide. So great time to take a bio break and we can uh, kind of read some of you want. I'll kind of go into the bank of break. Okay. Great. 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 Take five, take that. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Oh, I'll go. I'll go. i go. i i go. i go. i go. Uh, 
I have bad penmanship, so I got to really take my time writing. Otherwise, you will not be able to read it. Um, if you guys use LinkedIn, yeah, and you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, please do. I'm happy to connect with everyone. If I can be of any kind of help to anyone going forward, I'm happy to. And some folks from Tom class last time did this uh, connected with me actually helped someone who was interviewing and actually made a connection with her to someone I knew who actually got a job. Yeah, exactly. So, but you, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm mixing up two stories, but yes. My point being this don't come to me because you want a job because I, I can't give everyone a job. But um, it's a good example. People, the way to really succeed is to network, right? Everyone talks about networking. Networking is really important. So, you might come to me for advice. I have a problem. I might not be able to figure out your problem, but I might help you a little bit and then say, you should talk to this guy. I'll introduce you. And you keep that's how networks work. You keep it's like the nervous central nervous system in your body. You keep connecting and connecting until you really find that right fit. Okay. So think about LinkedIn as being a really good network tool, which I'm sure you guys already know because you guys know social media pretty well. Actually, right, we start. Hit, I would say if you're going to look come up on LinkedIn, it's the COO CFO profile. Oh, there are others. Yeah, this other marketing. There are other marketing keeps the popular name. Yeah. Um, anyway. All right, let's get started. So I'm going to tell you about Bainco, uh, and then I'm going to tell you about um, um, sort of start to finish. I'm going to skip a lot of the, the middle parts, but uh, really tell you who we were, how we got started, how we grew, how we went from those stages of entrepreneurship to enterprise to, to maturity, and then eventually sold the company. Um, so I'm going to start with Sam. So Sam Bain. Started Bain Co. in 1987. Prior to that, this is important. Prior to that, Sam was. Huh? Oh, yeah, I typed that wrong. I should say 2020, not 22. Sorry about that. Yeah, we're in 2022 right now. So I did not sell my company next month. Um, <laughs> let's just say 2020. It was the COVID years. Remember COVID years? Thanks. Um, Sam, before he started in Banco, he was a broker, right? He was a Wall Street broker. He worked at Merrill Lynch and DLJ, and his clients were high net worth clients. And he did really well. He made a ton of money. He was a great sales guy. Um, and back in the day, if, uh, if you're my client, I'm going to call you and say, hey, um, really hot stock, buy GE, 100 shares, you win? Yeah, okay, good. Because I think that's going to be, you know, so, so I'll just buy it in your account, and that's great. Um, and I make a commission when I do that. And if I call you and say, hey, let's sell your Apple stock, I'm going to make a commission on that too. Now, Apple stock could have gone down. It could have been a failure, but I'm still going to make a commission when I sell it. Because what they used to do is say, um, I'm going to make money on um, per share. So I'm going to make you know uh, $2 a share every time you sell or buy. I can't remember the rate for it. It was so long ago. But, but every time they buy or sell for you, they make money, whether or not it was a good stock or not. And they made a pile of money. And the SEC kind of let it go for a long time. And eventually the SEC kind of caught up to a lot of the practices and, and brokers and stuff. So it's, it's really not what it used to be. But it's just securities and exchange. Securities and exchange. And I'm going to get to that too, the SEC. So um, the key thing is this. What Sam noticed was he was frustrated. He was making a lot of money, but he was frustrated because he was thinking, well, if I'm building a portfolio for somebody, I'm doing it sort of in a vacuum. I don't really know anything about their tax situation. I don't know about their family. I don't know what their goals are and their needs are. Are they self-employed? Um, what's their estate? Do they have an estate plan? You know, are they, are they talking to the right people? How about insurance? So Sam was sort of one of the early um, adopters of being an RIA, Registered Investment Advisor. That means you're registered with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC pretty much polices the entire industry, you know, all the, the investment industry, basically. I'm trying to simplify this too. Um, so if you're registered with the SEC, it's kind of a big deal. You have to go the whole registration process. It takes you time. You need to kind of jump through some hoops. Um, and they keep an eye on you. They'll audit you. It's, it's a really rigorous type thing. So Sam started his RIA, Banco, in 1987. And he started on April Fool's Day. For those of you, do you have April Fool's in other countries? 
it's the day of the year you play tricks on people, right? You start on April Fool's Day, which is kind of a weird day. You start with three clients, the total of $9 million. I talked about that earlier. $9 million assets under management, that's being managed in their portfolios, not a lot of money. But he said, look, I'm gonna start this company. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not only just buy and sell your stocks, and I'll do it a lot cheaper than I was doing it, but I'm gonna charge you just a fee for managing your assets. I'm gonna make sure you have an estate plan. I'm gonna make sure that when I'm buying and selling security, I'm gonna make sure that it's tax advantageous for you. That if you need to take some losses at year end, because this time you manage your, you know, you wanna take some losses at year end because you had a really good year, let's get rid of some of those, those stocks that are kind of dogs. That'll help bring your capital um, uh, uh, capital gains tax down, so on and so forth. So Sam started the firm and um, it's a holistic approach, right? You're looking at the entire um, customer, the entire client. Today, that's a very common thing to say and a very common thing to do. I feel like every wealth management firm, RIA, use those terms to change Although not all wealth management firms are RIA, but not important today. Um, it's critical because um, so let me, let me back up a little bit. So for Sam, he's an early adopter, right? He wants to do this. He wants to kind of make a name for himself, this holistic. And he really believed it. He really believed that he, the best way to do this is by really understanding everything. And most people weren't doing it. Today, everyone's out there doing it. But back at that time, the key thing is when you looked around, there weren't a whole lot of people doing it. And people, he was, a, he was really, was a pioneer. So Think of it as technology. He had like an, a technology no one really had yet, you know, where people were kind of messing around with, but he had the one that was really working. Um, so because of his intelligence, because he was very resourceful, because he was very entrepreneurial, um, he started his business and made a lot of money. Now, by the way, started the business on April Fool's Day. Fast forward to October of that year, October 1987. Who knows what happened in October 1987? Black Monday? Yeah. Stock market crashed. So here he is. He only has a few clients. And he's just getting up, and all of a sudden the market goes, oh, right? It was it was awful. But he hung in there and he stayed with it, um, and didn't let him didn't let it stop it. Um, he built the company. He added people. He added some uh, people like partners who were really good at different things. He wanted to make sure he had a partner who was really good at wealth strategies, which is kind of like financial planning, to make sure they understood they had a financial plan. Um, were really good at portfolio management to make sure that they were building portfolios that were really um, um, appropriate for their families. And you could build it um, in a very specific way, specific for their family dynamic, if you will, right? Based on who they are. The stocks that we bought for our clients, we had a pool of stocks, let's say 40 or 50 stocks that pretty much all of our clients owned. And they would generally own around the same ratios of the stock. But, you know, if a client came in and was a, a tech person, had his own business, he already is investing in a lot of tech companies outside of what we do, then we're going to kind of lower his exposure to technology so not buy as much tech because you want to kind of, you know, kind of level things out a little bit where you believe he should be, uh, have the right amount of risk he should have for that sector, technology is a sector. I mean, it's not important, some of this detail I'm telling you, but just to get a sense of, you know, how he did things and why he did it. So he had a phenomenal amount of success, hiring the right people to come on board and manage different aspects of the company. He hired me in 1999 um, as a CFO, eventually COO, and eventually I, made, I, I became one of the senior partners. And um, what I did was a little different than what everyone else did. Pretty much everyone else in the firm was client-facing. I mean, whatever they did had to do with supporting the client, um, reports, buying and selling stocks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, research, it was just, it's crazy. What I did was I ran the company. Uh, yeah, I'm keeping the books and I'm you know, creating the financial statements, I'm uh, creating budgets, I'm looking to figure out why the budget and actual are off and um, I'm making sure the lights are on and I'm making sure that we have contracts in place. And I was sort of the legal guy. I don't have a legal background, but I was sort of the in-house legal person. I was the in-house HR person. I was the in-house technology person. And I'm not a big technology guy, but, you know, someone had to do it. And it was always me. Things fell on me that weren't directly related to supporting client portfolio. Um, I loved that. Now, some of you might say, well, I hate doing that. I want to have a team. I, want to have a... I, you know, I was an important part of the team. But I didn't really have a team. Or I had a system that worked with me. And I really used other people in the organization to feed information when and how I needed it. But 
I was sort of like, I liked it. I liked being that guy who was different and who was contributing in a way that most people didn't really even understand. Eventually they do and they, they get it. Um, and I liked not having to live to other live up to other people's standards because I knew best how to do my job. Now, most companies, you can't really say that. Some people can, but most people can't. But because we're a small company, I knew that no one else knew how to run a business like I did. And I was learning as I was going too. I wasn't, you know, I didn't walk in and say I know everything, but I learned as I went. I was resourceful. I learned things. I became pretty proficient in the technology side and the legal side. I learned how to read legal documents and kind of understand where the important parts of the contracts were, um, deal with vendors and so on and so forth. So, um, so I'm an example of someone Sam hired to have some expertise in an important part of the company. Um, and the others I didn't go into detail because that's what they did, this is what I did, okay? So as we kept going on, none of us will get any younger. Sam today is around 76, 77 years, around mid to late seventies, right? He wasn't getting any younger. Um, so put that in its place for a second. The other thing was, we were trying to promote some people to junior partner. And along the way, and some some other partners left. You know, sometimes it happens to hey, I get another opportunity, I'm going to leave. When things happen in the partnership, we're an LLC, a limited liability company registered in the state of Massachusetts. And so when a partner leaves, um, it's not always simple about how you buy back their stock. It's not always simple about can you buy back? Can you force to buy back this stock? Is there a formula in their, in their uh, partnership agreement that dictates it? And honestly, Sam had done so many things with different partners and some of the, some of the early clients were partners too. It's some things that were, he was doing it as he was going, but he was too busy with everything else to really make it make sense. And so he did one thing for one partner, another thing for another partner, and it was kind of a mess. And so along the way, we would hire um, eventually probably a good 10 years ago, hired an investment banker who was kind of specialized in our industry, in the investment industry and the wealth management. He bought a lot of, uh, bought and sold a lot of companies in our industry. He's on the West Coast, but he was um, well-known around the industry. Um, we hired him to do, not to sell the company, but 10 years ago, we hired him to do a valuation for us. Remember the know that sell thing? Because you talk to a partner who's coming in or going or whatever and say, okay, I'll, I'll buy back your shares at this price per share. And they said, no way, you're it's worth more than that. You know, you have this fight, but you no one can quite exchange all the variables. There's so many variables on valuation, and no one's going to have the same opinion, especially if you're on the other side of the table, right? So we got a valuation, our very first one, and it was time. Um, all the information that we had to give to the investment banker, he processed it, crunched it, and interviewed people. It was just this crazy, probably two or three month process the first time he did it. And he gave us a book, um, and the book was detailed and very telling. And a lot of the stuff in the book was not very good. Um, most of it was good, don't get me wrong. Valuation was good, and it was actually around where we kind of thought it was going to be. But now we got a professional telling us that's your evaluation. But he kind of gave us a lot of insight into you're doing that wrong. That's you can't sustain that. You got to fix that. See this over here. This person is important to what you're doing, and if you don't pay them more, they're going to walk out. And that's going to do the answer. Like it was things like that, things about technology, all sorts of stuff like that. So we had to swallow hard, listen, and really respect what he was telling us. He was a professional. He was a third party. He knew our industry. He knew what other people were doing. And not that we agree with everything he said. You don't have to take everything someone says, you know, as 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 as, uh, as absolute. But we really did make some serious changes along the way. And so being able to step up and say, yeah, we're not as good as we thought we were. Uh, we're not running this business as efficiently as we should. Um, we need to fix something. So the know thyself thing was really critical. That was a big turning point for know thyself of us. Um, Sam, by the way, keep in mind, is an entrepreneur. He's that kind of, don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. I'll do it this way. Don't worry about it. He was like, you know, back of the matchbook and, and, and certain things. And me, I was the analytical guy. So I was always sort of, Drawing him back in and saying, yeah, we can't, but it's fine. He'll go and say, this isn't this, this. We wouldn't agree, so that'd be great. I'd go back and run the analytics, right? And I'd say, look, here's what it's going to look like if we do this, this, and this. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, it kind of gives it. But that's how entrepreneurs are. You know, they just think, no, 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 it's, it's fine, just do this. 
So it's a good combination of an entrepreneur and someone who's analytical, and a lot of other people too are analytical, kind of draw him in and try to um, really, um, you know, understand um, how to keep that balance. So we fixed a lot of things along the way. We got some junior partners on board who were, you know, really important um, employees of ours that we thought we need to make them partner because they're going to be. Um, we actually ended up in 2000, I don't know, 2018, 17. We sort of threw away everyone's partnership. I'm saying this in a really casual way. It was very complicated. We ripped up everyone's partnership agreements and we basically said, this is the senior partnership agreement. This is the junior partnership agreement. This is how you dictate valuation. We're going to use a formula, a multiple. We're going to, you know, use this EBITDA, blah, blah, blah. And we kind of, we got an attorney to really, it was hard. It was so hard first to admit that you had such a mess. You've grown this company, you have a lot of assets, and you're great with the clients. But internally, you know, we weren't, we didn't have everything lined up well. So we fixed all that stuff and cleaned it up, and it was great. So things along the way, we got more valuations. Same guy, we got more valuations along the way. The future valuations were better because it didn't take as long because he knew a lot about us. We developed a relationship with him, right? The relationship thing. But he knew us better. So doing the valuations, he didn't have to start from scratch. It was a lot easier. Besides that, there were less things that we were fixing along the way. You know, he's saying, yeah, you're doing pretty well. You know, this is kind of fixed and that's going well. Maybe you should try this, you know? So the investment banker relationship was definitely growing uh, with us. Uh, and meanwhile, the investment bank was doing some things that we weren't really, we never hired one before. He was doing some really critical things. He was giving us insight along the way on what the industry was doing in, in our industry, in the wealth management field, right? What the industry is doing as a whole, who's selling, what types of companies are selling, there's roll-ups, there's acquirers, there's also different ways of the, the larger companies are gobbling up the smaller ones and then bringing them on board in a lot of different types of ways. And he was giving us an education all the different ways and how the valuations are working, what kind of multiples were out there, uh, what kind of what, what people were actually selling for, and then talking about um, earnouts. Do you have to know what an earnout is? Okay, an earnout's a really important thing when you're selling your company, okay? And most companies when they sell their business have an earnout. This is how an earnout works. We got to a point, we sold our company for a fixed price. They paid us on New Year's Eve, 2020, not 2022. Um, and they said, look, we don't want to buy your company and all you partners and portfolio managers quit and go sell, take, you know, take your money and go home and quit whatever. Because that's a lot of risk to us because your clients who you have relationships with will probably stop bailing on us. So we want you to stay on for three more years. You stay on for three years and you can take the revenue that you generated in Boston and build it here, here, and here over those three years. We'll pay you more and more and more money. It's in their best interest because the more we make for them, the more we make and the more they make. And now those relationships are more solid because those relationships after three years they're not thinking bank anymore. They're thinking Sarity Partners. Sarity is the one who bought us, okay? So they're thinking the risk is a lot less if people leave that to three years, right? So an earnout is just that. It can be structured in all sorts of different ways. It doesn't have to be three years. It can be one year. It can be 10 years. It can be anything. But it's an incentive to make more money after the transaction in return for something. It's usually for more revenue growth. So we're in the midst of that right now. At the end of 2023, that'll be done. So end of 2023, New Year's Eve 2023, uh, we will no longer have the ability to make money off of this transaction. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if I colored off on that tangent, but I really went down the rabbit hole there. But that stuff's pretty critical. Let me go back a little bit. So as we were building the company and trying to uh, really understand value, and, and did I say this to you before? I want to drive this point home because I kind of went over it quickly. I talked about Sam starting the business as a relationship business, really getting to know people. But once you get to know them, they trust you and they stick with you and they don't leave just because you made one mistake. They don't leave just because one quarter had poor performance. It's a long-term investment in it, right? The relationships and the trust is what keeps them. The business before that Sam had was all transactional. It was a complete transactional business. I'll sell you a stock, you're gonna pay me money. Buy a stock, pay me money. It was all transactional. It had nothing to do with the big picture. Nothing to do with the family, nothing to do with their business, nothing to do with anything else. No 
I don't want to say no relationship because sure there were relationships, but it was a transactional business and Sam wanted to have a relationship business. And when you build a relationship business, the people who work for you become your biggest asset. They say your biggest asset gets on the elevator every night and goes home, right? And in our industry, it was true. So you have to treat your employees really well, right? You want them to stay. You got to pay them well and be fair. Bonus programs, you got to be competitive, right? Because if they're doing a good job for the clients and they leave the company, you don't want the client following them to the next place, right? So you want to keep your employees happy. And we also work in a team, right? When I talk about team before, we actually do construct teams around each client. So you have a client family, live in California. They have about $20 million of assets under management with us. Um, great family, the three adult children, uh, a lot of stuff going on there. They have a, a lung cancer foundation because she had lung cancer, she survived it. She put everything she had into this foundation that's been one of the most successful in that area uh, over the years. Um, so you have this relationship. And instead of saying, hey, uh, Robert, you're gonna be in charge of this relationship and other people will help you, but it's you, it's you and that, right? But what happens if Robert leaves? They're probably gonna follow him because if he wasn't happy, for whatever reason he leaves, they're gonna follow him. Instead, we say, okay, it's gonna be Robert and Jessica, and Bob and two, right? And they all do different things as part of the team. One builds a portfolio. Uh, one of them is wealth management. One of them is more admin, not creating reports and moving money than you need to. One of them is a backup uh, portfolio person. So if someone on vacation, something happens in the market, they can step in and kind of help out and stuff. So you, you basically introduce the team to clients so that if one person on the team left, not a huge change. And I'm not saying it's not a change. And I'm not saying it's not an important change. But it's not sort of live or die kind of change. That's really important. That team really gave us a great deal of uh, uh, value because the teams allowed us to retain our clients far better than most of our competition did. We retain our clients at a rate of like ninety-two percent at one point. Retaining ninety-two percent is crazy good. Most companies do it from like you know sixty to eighty-five, let's say, and sixty is low, by the way. But the turnover in clients is huge. Turnover employees are huge. Our employee turnover was very little. It actually came, happened more as we grew bigger. And I think part of that is us finding our ways to stay competitive with other people out there doing the same kind of thing out there. You learn along the way. Some got a better deal. Boy, we missed that one. So our turnover started getting worse as we started growing. And then we got kind of got a handle on it there. But this team approach, if you can retain your clients, and you can retain your employees, assuming they're good clients and good employees. I mean, that's half the battle of being a strong company with value. One of the other things that happened when we sold, excuse me, sold the company is we had the opportunity to get a retention bonus. And this happens a lot too. We sell a company 12, 31, 20. If at least 90% of your clients are still on board a year from now, we'll pay you X. We had 98% still on board a year later. And someone literally passed away. That's the client we lost. They passed away. They had seven children. The money went to seven different places. And it sort of, none of the seven were enough to really stay with us. So they all went to different directions. That, stupid, right? And I'm not saying we lose clients. We do lose clients. But in this year, <laughs> we didn't lose any clients. Because generally, our, 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 our uh, client retention is really important. So customer retention, client retention. So who else has an iPhone, right? Most of you probably have an iPhone. I do. So if you have an iPhone, I'm going to guess you probably have, you know, um, a laptop, a Mac laptop. Uh, you probably have maybe the uh, iMac desktop. You probably have, uh, you probably had an iPod back in the day. Uh, you probably have, um, whatever, use iCloud, Apple TV. I mean, use all the, you kind of become like, you know, kind of a good customer of Apple because they figured out how to rope you in and keep you in. And you're kind of scared to leave because, well, if I leave, all my data is up in the cloud and I kind of like the laptop. And if I get a different phone, I still download music and it's Apple music. And, you know, it's all these things. They kind of make like, you're a prisoner, right? That's their retention. Our retention was just giving them good service. And that's what we did. We were really good at servicing the clients. The client called into something. We never said, no, you can't do that. We'd say, hmm, that's tricky. Give us a day. Let us think about it and figure something out. And we would usually go back and say, okay, not going to happen the way you want it to because it can't. There's legalities here, there's this and that. But we came up with this. 
we would talk to their outside advisor. We would talk to their, um, they would have a, a tax person. They would have an attorney, a state planning attorney. And, and if something came up, we would talk to those people and make sure that the, the advice that we were giving still made sense from a tax perspective, still made sense for their estate and so on and so forth. So we were that resourceful type of team and we still are working for our clients and that's how you get retention. The best thing, this is gonna sound really funny, the best thing that can happen for client retention for a client is for something really bad to happen to the client. I don't mean they get hit by a bus. I mean, something bad to happen financially. That what you do is you are the ones who save the day. You go in there and say, okay, that is wrong. We're gonna, it's gonna, it might take weeks, but we'll go in and we'll figure it out. We just, I'm telling you, it's stuff we've never even heard of. We'll figure it out. We'll call the right people. We'll bring the team in, the outside team, the inside team. We'll figure it out. Once that client gets through that problem, client for life, they'll never leave you. I mean, it's such a bonding experience. And, you know, think about a relationship. Sometimes even, you know, married couples, something bad happens and sometimes it can bring it together. It can also, you know, go the other way as well. But in the client situation, they just feel like, wow, if you build me out of that, I would not leave. I don't care if someone else rates in that. We tried the healthy rate too. And we deserve it because we worked hard for it and we got returns and we got good service. So anyway, I'm off on a tangent. I'm going to go and kind of look at the rest of this and see what I can fill in and fill in the blanks. So I really do want to get to the transaction a little bit more and kind of fill you in on, um, let's see, is this fine? Yeah, this might be the next one. Here we go. Firm history. I told you about firm history, exit plan. So the exit plan, I, and I kind of weaved this in. I already told you about hiring the investment banker. That is actually when we started um, seriously thinking about our exit plan. Now, the company was premature at that point. It was beyond standing an entrepreneur and everyone were into mess. It was, I joined kind of in that entrepreneur into enterprise, where it's like, Sam's still calling the shot but we were implementing a lot of process. It was kind of taken over for him just saying, dictating everything, right? We grew the company in assets to maturity. And so in our industry, specifically in our industry, once you hit a billion dollars in assets under management in a wealth management firm, you become a much more serious candidate for an acquisition from one of the big companies. And that's why I say that kind of gets you over the, once we hit that $1 billion in assets, it kind of got us to that maturity point where it's like, Things are really running. We have processes in place. We have departments in place. We have contingency plans in place. Um, our risks are very low. Even though Sam is aging, he's getting up there in age, can't do it as well as he could before. It just happens. It's life, right? Um, we had it built pretty well. But even if Sam got hit by the bus, that we had someone heading up every area, every department, um, and every client situation that we felt like we could still, we might lose a couple of clients. That does happen if something happened to Sam. But we really thought that we were in a really good place. Um, you know, eventually, when we sold the company, we were at 1.5 billion. So that's kind of where we were in that um, in that uh, maturity phase. So me, I'm going to talk about me now. Anything I'm about to say and anything I have said that sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, I'm not. It just so happens when it comes to stuff like this, the CFO, COO, especially in a small company, really becomes the the driver, the point of contact, the person kind of doing a lot of the grunt work and a lot of, right? And and so I started edu educating myself on um, exit planning years ago, well before the investment bank. I joined the exit planning exchange. Uh, there's a lot of exchanges like that, a bunch of like-minded people who support um, people who are in business. And you get together every month and there's you know seminars and programs and teach you how to deal with you know, business owners and so on and so forth. I started understanding valuations. I started understanding our business. I, um, do you guys know what a chart of accounts is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. The chart of accounts basically is when you look at a um, um, a balance sheet, an income statement, you say we have cash, we have accounts receivable, you know, we have um, assets, whatever it is. Like each of those is an account, right? And a chart of accounts is just your chart, your list of all your accounts, and it's it is divided between your assets, your current assets, long-term assets, liquid assets, long-term assets, liabilities, long-term liabilities, debt, all sorts of stuff and gets into detail. Your chart of accounts that dictates where everything feeds your financial statements. So when you run your financial statements, your analytics, 
everything is kind of presented based on how your chart of accounts is designed. Our chart of accounts was um, sort of started before I got there and it worked. It was a very basic, straightforward one. But what I learned, one of the things I learned along the way is um, when uh, we were talking in the industry about other companies and trying to see if, you know, where we stack up in statistics, because I was doing a lot of digging, I had to go and take our financials and you know, on an Excel spreadsheet, kind of move things around, and because they call this, you know, um, you know, uh, part of uh, gross uh, revenue, and I have it down in expense, and da, 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 and all this geeky accounting stuff, right? But it was like this process every time I tried to do it. So I said, Sam, I'm gonna change the chart of accounts, and he kind of did what you guys did, like, you know, what does that mean? Like, and you didn't know what the chart of accounts was either, right? All I said was, it doesn't change, and it's just that our financial presentation is going to look a lot different. It's going to look like industry standard financial presentation. Because then once we did it, and it was a pain in the ass, by the way, it's really, it's not hard to do, but it was a pain because I knew every account, every account number, like, you know, then I'm older now and had to learn all these new accounts, new account numbers. And I was like, oh, watch what's that account again. So um, anyway, and then teaching Sam and the other partners, like, okay, this is where that presented now, right? But you go through little things like that. I didn't tell you that story is because it made it so much easier for us to compare ourselves to the industry. You know, where are we? Are we, uh, are these ratios really, is that really good that our client retention is 92 or could be 95, you know? There's all these different things. So um, you do things, when you start learning about exit planning, you do things that start teeing you up for that final day, whenever that's going to be. Now, Sam never wanted to sell. This is his baby, his identity. He worked around the clock on weekends, nights. He just lived and breathed it. You know, clients would call him while he was on vacation with his kids and whatever. Your typical, you know, around the clock. Many of us were saying along the way, Sam, we got to think about selling because the market's not good. And blah, 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 blah. And he said, nope, nope, not yet, not yet, not yet. To his credit, if we had sold all those other times, we would have made a nothing compared to what we made. We really sold that, you know, knock on wood to date at the perfect time. Like, really was the perfect time. I'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, so, So chart of accounts is one thing that helps you understand where you are. You know, know thyself and then know others. You can't really know others until you really get to know yourself. Um, I started partnering with a lot of the people that we were already partners with. So we had our clients' um, assets, um, custody of Pershing, some of Fidelity, all that stuff. So I started leaning on all these relationships and said, um, hey, you know, how do you do this? How do all the clients do this? To take you to lunch and all that. Okay, just kind of barrage on the questions. And then one of them, Pershing, most of our clients' assets were at Pershing. Pershing is one of the biggest custodians in the land. A custodian is like a bank for your investments, right? That's the, the only term investment. Owned by Bank of New York, one of the biggest in the world. Okay, that's what most of our assets, client assets were. They started developing a program and they started in Boston. And I was one of the first ones they asked to do this. And they would have dinners at one of the fancy restaurants in Boston. And it was a private room, a round table with probably you know seven or eight of us around the table two or three people from Persian or Bank of New York, and then the rest of us who were like my equivalents, CFOs, COOs, or CEOs of firms like ours who are all clients of Persian. And we'd get together like every quarter, and we would just have a couple of topics that Persian would introduce, and we'd all just talk it out. And you think, well, that's your competition. Why are you talking about your competition and tell them what your secret sauce is? You don't share your secret sauce. You know, what you share is everything else. Uh, do you ever hear the, 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 the phrase, uh, all boats rise with the tide, right? So what we all realize is the more we help each other, we're helping our industry, we're helping our clients, we're all bettering ourselves. Because if I help you today, I know that you're going to help me next time we have one of those things. I learned a lot from these guys and they learned a lot from me. We all, it, was, it was information sharing and they still do it. They do it in all these other markets as well. And, and the reason they started, one of the reasons, I don't think it'd be real. One of the reasons is the guy who started it, was doing that with me. I would go out to lunch from every quarter and I'd pepper them. And then he started, someone in New York had this idea of like, should you get people together? And he's like, all right, start here. Mark will be one, you know what I mean? It was, it was great. So um, well, I was doing all that um, investigative work and what we needed to do. And honestly, it wasn't welcomed by most of the partners because it was new to them. Sam was very resistant for a lot of reasons. He it's a control feature here. I know it's his baby, it's who he is. Um, if he sold, what would he do? There's only so much golf I can play. If he didn't have any hobbies, it was like, I, I, I work, that's what I do. So 
I kept doing it in the background. Every once in a while, I would make some suggestions on significant suggestions on. We used to have a broker deal list that we owned in house that we traded the client securities that we were putting in portfolios. And eventually, um, the industry changed a lot. After the whole Bernie Madoff thing, you heard of Bernie Madoff, he ripped a lot of people off in very major ways um, back around up until 2008 when he got caught. Um, after that happened, all sorts, the SEC came down with all sorts of new regulations, so it could never happen again and all this stuff. Um, one of the things was it made it very difficult to own your own, a small boutique um, brokerage firm um, because they put all these ridiculous um, controls in place. They were so arduous that I and we could not keep up with it. And we weren't making that much money because rates were all coming down. Rates were all coming down in brokerage. Does anyone know why brokerage rates started coming down? You know, like what happened in the brokerage world that changed significantly over the last 10, 15 years? Okay, everyone watch this TV here, I assume? Mm -hmm. Okay, how many commercials do you see Fidelity or Merrill Lynch or, uh, or Bank of America just by, came out with Bank of America by, Morgan Stanley. They all talk about, oh, uh, TD, come here. It's, it's uh, ten, uh, $10 for any trip. Right, because it used to be a trade. If you had a lot of shares, you would pay per share. So if you sold a thousand shares and I was selling a hundred shares, right, I would only pay a tenth of what you're paying. But it's the same transaction. They hit the same button to sell a hundred shares as they do a thousand shares, right? But they're making ten times as much because you happen to have more. Is that fair? Yeah, that wasn't fair. It didn't really make sense. And so what these when technology caught up, the technology platforms allowed so much efficiencies to happen. In the brokerage world, right? Instead of going the old fashioned way to telephone, what's the price? Blah, 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 all of a sudden, technology stepped in and allowed Fidelity and all these other TV and so forth to be so efficient that they developed them as loss leaders. You know what loss leader is? So they say, look, I mean, we're going to bring our price down so much, $10 a trade, so that all the little guys won't be able to afford to stay in business. And that's true. We really couldn't afford to use their rate. We couldn't. We we're too small. The other thing is this. They might not even make money at ten dollars. They might lose money at ten dollars. The loss leader because the commercials are so great, they get clients and they say, "Oh, you want it? Ten dollars? Piece of cake. Open up a fidelity account. Once they open a fidelity account, now they have uh, interest on their um, uh, on their cash. They have products that sell to them. They can get into fidelity fund. All of a sudden, the loss leader draws you in. It costs them money sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. But once they're in, man." Apple all over again. It's like, I don't want to leave. I have all sorts of stuff going on here. Like, I don't want this to be, right? So anyway, the industry changed. I made a whole presentation, an analysis on, we got to sell, that we sell. We're actually going to make more money. And the money we're going to make is because we are spinning on wheels being brokers when we're really good at being investment advisors. That's what we were designed for. That's what we're good at. This transactional business, uh, yeah, it made us money, but we weren't necessarily the best brokers. We were just buying and selling, yeah, whatever. But you know what? You know, let the brokers do the brokerage business. Let us focus on our business. And when we did, we started, that was the year we literally started our revenues and new clients coming in to go just like this because the people they were kind of like this. Going out, there's always, they just started skyrocketing. The focus was amazing. Us being able to define our model of people was really important to find who we were and, and so on and so forth. And I realize I'm, I'm probably going off on more tangents. So I'm going to, Keep going with this a little bit so we don't run out of time. We have plenty more time for questions, too. Talked about the rolling investment banker, valuation analysis. Um, the market for, you know, taught us all this stuff. Uh, talked about all this stuff, understanding our strengths and weaknesses. We made a decision to sell in the fourth quarter of 2019. We engaged the investment advisor. I'm saying this fast because I already said all this stuff. Um, and then we engaged the legal people and tax people and other types of people that we're going to need to do. And these are people we knew. Again, we had relationships with good tax people, with good uh, legal people. So again, it made it so much better that we could trust who we were working with. And we didn't have to start from scratch saying, hey, this is who we are, this is what we do, you know, no, we don't do that. You know, it's just those relationships that Bill Belichick's talking about, this is what it's all about. When you need people, you want them to be there for you. And they're not going to be there if you don't have a relationship with them. We determined our valuation range. When I say range, we said, we'll sell for this amount. That's the minimum. If someone comes to us and says this, we'll sell. Paying less than that, no. 
well, we think we might solve that. You know, we think we could, on our, our, our best day, we might solve for that. So this is our range, right? So anything in there, we're going to be talking to people and doing the diligence. We end up selling for like this. Word of God, it was just far more than we expected. And I'll get into why in a few minutes. Um, but that's a range for your sellers. So you go into selling, not saying, I need $10 million for this company, that's it. No, you kind of say, look, it could be this or it could be as high as this because there's so many variables that you have. As long as you know yourself, know thyself, you're going to understand that there's certain things that might bring that valuation down. A certain type of company is going to bias versus this kind of company. You know, so you kind of keep your range, uh, keep your range there. Oops. Um, COVID hit, our technology was tested, it worked good, markets were shaken, but it went back, created a data room. Oh, boy. So this is where it all came down on me. So during COVID, I had to create a data room, an electronic data room with, ended up being hundreds of documents, literally. You had to put all sorts of stuff in there for the last five years. Um, you know, go back and show this, show that, show that. A lot of the stuff we had, it was great. I just uploaded it. A lot of the stuff we didn't have, so I had to create. A lot of the stuff we had, but it was kind of no good, so I had to fix. Um, this kept going on and on and on. During this time, our employees didn't know we were selling the company. Couldn't tell our employees. We couldn't tell our clients because it scares employees off and it scares clients off. So there's a certain amount of time that you kind of are, are, are kind of going under the radar. Because as soon as you tell someone and it gets out, your valuation goes down because all of a sudden everyone knows you're trying to sell and word gets out that people can position themselves a certain way to make you look worse, make themselves look better and blah, 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 blah. Or clients are going to get scared. The thing's going to change. You're going to leave. I'm just going to go somewhere else now, you know? So we had to do this um, quietly with only a handful of people. So it was me and I had to trust my assistant. I took her into my trust and she was fantastic. I could not have done it without her because it was it was like a five person job. And luckily we had two of us doing it. Um, learned a lot. I mean, I've learned so much in this process of not just creating this data room. So by the way, the data room is so that when a buyer comes in, they're really serious. They start saying, well, let me see your such and such. The investment banker has it, they package it, they send it out. They don't have to say, Mark, you just scramble now and get all these, these 20 documents that this company is looking for. That happened anyway, by the way. We had the data room. We're all set to go. When the buyers start coming in, oh my gosh. They had rounds and rounds and rounds of 20. The first one was 58 items that they wanted me to create for them. And I was like, how can there be 58 items that are not in this data room? I have everything in this data room. How could that possibly be? But there were. Next round, 20 more things. 20 more, it just kept happening and happening. So, but the data room was great because it really took, you know, it took most of it and, 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 and took care of, you know, the, the basics of it. So data room is pretty critical to all of that. So the next thing that happens in a sale um, <clears throat> is building the slide there. It's like hundred plus pages. It's a marketing booklet. It's like when a real estate agent says, oh, here's, here's the house that pretty pictures and Statistics. I have to ask you a question. Yeah. You talk about the, the data. Now, thinking of the time frame, you make as a company, a team, you make the decision in fourth quarter of 19 to sell. Right. You've got the team all going, the game plan, execution, data room going and work. And then all of a sudden, COVID hits. What was the, what was the, uh, the thing? It happened a little different than that because we decided to sell in 2019, fourth quarter. I didn't start building the, the data room until it was. It was February when I started building it. So it was just before, and March was that critical month of COVID, I think, when it hit in the US. Mm -hmm. um, I started in February, and it'll launder this. The investment bank said, you know, all these things, like it was pages and pages of stuff that I had to work with. Um, COVID hit. I was still on my own. In fact, my assistant didn't know anything at this point. When I started, it was just, um, I was still on my own, starting to build it. But of course, the trepidation came in. So. As soon as we, as soon as COVID hit, yeah, we kind of survived that transition into COVID, but we were kind of scared to death. What's going to change? If these markets go down, that means we build clients based on the assets under management. It's a fixed rate percentage of their assets. So their assets go up, we make more money. They go down, we make less money. Whatever they do, up, down, sideways, it doesn't matter. That's our revenue and that leads to our profit. So if markets go down, our revenue goes down, our profits go down. We were scared to death of this happening during COVID. So this was a real scare. So which did happen at the beginning of it? Oh, totally happened. It was, and I think it was March to May 
was very difficult. That actually kind of coming back around me, if I remember correctly, but it took a dive. It nose dive. And it should have. I mean, who had confidence in anything when COVID first hit, right? You just lost confidence in everything. And you said, boy, I could get rid of these tech stocks. I gotta, or actually, some tech stocks you went fine because Zoom went to the roof, right? But other things, retail, right? If you're in retail stocks, like, oh, retail kind of online retail is great, but anyone who has bricks and mortar going out of business, really tough. So I don't know if I answered your question exactly, but the time is a little different than what you got. More of this perspective of that professional company that way. It was tough. I mean, I literally sold the company for my living room. And um, it was quite an experience. Here's the good news. The best part of that was that because we had to be sort of under the radar for a while for a few months, it was actually easier being in our homes and calling each other, you know, yeah. than, you know, and one why, why are these secret meetings going on down yeah. the hall? You know, why is everyone a conference room? What are you talking about? Like it would have been a lot harder. I don't know how people do it. So that was like the one good thing that came out of the, the, the situation we were in. And I'm not suggesting it was good, but that, that was one of the, the things that actually helped us. But it was a weird thing selling from my living room. So you get on these calls, you start, you start, um, one of my slides will show this, but you're starting with um, I don't know, maybe a thousand different companies that could potentially buy it. The investment bank is feeding us. And he kind of synthesizes it down to maybe two or 300, which is still a lot, right? Then you start kind of going through and you kind of picking off companies saying, now nah, they, they, the way they invest money is very different the way we invest money, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of knock it down to uh, maybe 50 or 60 better. Okay, these are real companies that potentially could buy us, right? Eventually the 50 or 60 gets what whittled down to 20 to 10 to five and eventually to one. And as it's kind of pouring down like this, you're getting closer and closer and closer to reality. So you get the you get the um, sort of buyers to initially give you a letter of intent, right? Letter of intent. Yeah, you know, that's for a little bit here. You synthesize a long list of buyers. You start accepting indications of interest first. So indication of interest maybe might come from those fifty or sixty. We sort of say, yeah, we well, kind of interesting. You know what they do? They throw you um, offers. They're kind of not real offers. They're, they're offers, though. They kind of say, look, I'll buy you this amount of money, and I'll give you this for an out and this for retention. And everyone that came with one of those indications of interest with these offers, so to speak, they were built into a spreadsheet by the investment banker so they could look at each one. And they were so different. I mean, bottom lines are so different. Some were really small up front, but huge on the on the earnouts. Some are huge on the bottom, small in the earnouts, which is kind of what we wanted. Um, and once you say, oh, we want this one, then you start to dig a little bit with the investment banker and they say, nah, these people, there's no way that your client would ever adopt the way that they do business. They would never let you do anything you do right now. They would completely change everything else together. So these are kind of things. They throw these, these numbers out there to kind of say, see if we're in the ballpark. And they start whittling down from there. So these indications of interest are, yep, I got the marketing book. I kind of like the pictures. I like the story. And I could maybe buy it for this. And nothing's in concrete. Then eventually start receiving preliminary offers. And those offers are a little more serious, right? They, they start to get a little more detailed. But again, they're a little bit out there. Until you finally get down to, um, you've already been down to maybe four or five that are real. And at this point, you're doing some significant negotiating in, in general, on general terms, right? Um, and eventually you're whittling it down to one. And so we finally whittled it down to Saturday, the state of Saturday partner class. And as you whittle it down to one, the day you make it official is the day you sign the exclusivity agreement. And that the agreement says, okay, as of today, for a period of 45 days, we will not talk to any other potential buyer except you. It's just you. It's you and us. Um, so that's when all the work really begins. They make the hard press. What they're doing is they're developing. Um, they're developing a letter of intent. Letter of intent is a pretty serious document. Um, it's a legal document. <clears throat> it's about, I don't know. Could be 10 pages, ours was about 12 pages long, right? And it pretty much outlines their offer. Again, in general terms, but some of it's pretty specific. And if I think back to that letter of intent, pretty much that was generally the final deal that happened. Now, the devil's in the details, so many details. 
But that letter of intent pretty much says, in writing, this is our offer. It's a real offer. And we can hold them to it. They can hold us to the to accepting it once we accept it. So eventually you sign, you keep going back and forth and you negotiate the letter of intent. It's like, well, I don't like this paragraph. We'll change this word. I'll change that. Up. Just, so you're negotiating these terms kind of early on with letter of intent. And then they say, and every time they send you a new one, here, Sam. We would like to nail all this you know, language in there. It seems kind of silly, right? We're all kind of developing a document, but it's important. Once we sign a letter of intent, that's when you have to sit down your employees and say, look, it's going to happen. It's about three months before we actually, and you know, before the end of the year, before we actually did it. Uh, we took them all to Sam's house. Sam has this beautiful farm. Uh, you know, funny calling it a farm. It's a beautiful house in Dover. Um, a really gorgeous town is. Great. So we were all out there. It was October. COVID was going on. So we uh, put set up chairs in the yard on the farm and we're all like, you know, distance, you know, and, and Sam made the announcement and we you know, talked to everybody about what was going to happen. All your jobs are secure. We made sure that no matter what we did, no matter who's going to buy us, no one's going to lose their jobs unless they wanted to. Um, my situation was different. I volunteered to lose my job and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so you break it to the employees. You get the letter of intent, you tell your employees, the employees can't say a word to anyone. You know, it's like the cone of silence, they can't tell anyone. This is when your due diligence really starts. Due diligence is the process of digging into the buyer, the buyer digging into the seller, right? They start looking at, so Maria said, then the buyer starts to send you all the requests. That's when they send me the whatever number of page uh, requests, and they kept sending more and more and more. They were doing due diligence, they want to see everything. And you can't hold back anything because you have an agreement. They cannot tell anyone, you know, they're, they're you know, uh, you know, looking, um, uh, I'm trying to use a better expression that's in my head, but they are seeing everything, okay? And um, that process becomes really difficult to keep up with that. Luckily, I already had my assistant working with me. She helped a lot. One of my other partners was actually becoming a really big help as well. Um, and you're negotiating the real details of the sale. You have a letter of intent. What you're really going to design is, uh, in our case, what's known as uh, an APA, it's an asset purchase agreement. They actually bought the assets of our firm. They actually didn't buy the company itself. Uh, not important for you to know, but if you buy the company, they would buy Banco and Banco would get rolled up into them. They did. Banco still exists because Banco still has a deal with them that Banco still earns a um, an earnout in these three years. So Banco, was, all they did was they bought our assets. They bought the desks and the computers, the client list, you know, everything that kind of, you know, basically everything except our company, and as a company. So it's an asset purchase agreement. That's not that important. That's important, but the distinction is not that important. Stock purchase, right? You buy the stock of the company, which means you buy the entire company. It's your company. Including your reputation, any kind of liabilities. Everything. So at this point, this is pretty exciting. You sign the asset purchase agreement. I'm going to get back to something that's really important. Yeah. <clears throat> the way our contracts were with our clients, we had to get client consents for the sale to actually go through. We had to have our clients, we had to tell them we were selling. This is before we actually sold. Tell them we're selling. Tell them who's buying us. Tell them why we're selling. Tell them why it's not going to affect them. It's going to be a good thing, right? You kind of kind of sell them on it, but you're getting totally honest. And they have to sign a document, a consent document, saying, "Okay, I'm with you. I'll let you. I, I consent to transferring my contract to the new company." We had, if we couldn't get at least ninety percent of our clients to consent, as soon as you drop below ninety percent, they start dinging us. You know, you lose this much money. You lose this much money. You lose this much money. Second ding because you didn't get enough clients to say yes. 100% of our clients said yes, 100%. The buyer, this buyer started, they make so many acquisitions, they continue to, they said, we no. never actually saw 100%. Okay. Plus we thought it was 98%. Relationships, that's what I keep telling you, the Belichick thing, relationships are so important. We had these relationships so well, we didn't lose any clients, didn't lose a penny on us. They all said yes, they bought it. And we didn't bullshit them. It was a, it was a, it was a good transaction for them and a good transaction for us. So, Preparing clients, you never know when you're going to need a relationship. And, and again, yeah. the day you need it is not the day you got to look for it because you're going to get taken to the industry, you know? 
we finalized the transaction, all the money moved and the stock moved because we mostly for cash, but we bought some of the stock too. And um, happened at 12, 20, which is the correct date. And I can't even tell you how my New Year's Eve was that. So I'm at my desk in my house and I'm waiting. Like we, everything was signed already. And that day it was supposed to be, okay, the money's going to move. I already told them, okay, this much goes to this person, this person, this person. It was all allocated, blah, 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 you know. We all had our bank accounts, all the wire instructions. It was all teed up. I had already contacted the bank well ahead of time to say, look, a bunch of money is going to come to our account. And on the same day, we're going to wire it to all these different accounts and blah, 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 right? And so the stress, I can't even tell you how stressed I was that day. I woke up on New Year's Eve day. I was like, this is the day. It's like, you know, we're going to cash out. We're going to make a lot of money. This is great. And I was waiting, waiting. I was, I was literally sitting at the computer, refresh, refresh. I'm like waiting for the wire to hit, like for hours. <laughs> Uh, that's all the call. I'm not saying I haven't seen it yet, but blah, blah, blah. Um, and then it hit. I was like, oh my gosh, it really hit. It really happened. And the reality of it sets in. Reality sets in. It's done. You know, you're, you're married. You just said, no, 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 no. You, you're, you're done. You know, you get the wings on, you're walking down the aisle. Um, it's really exciting. Um, all that hard work. I mean, so much hard work by so many people paid off so well. Now, story doesn't end there. Before I open up to questions, Story doesn't end there. Integrations. So after you sell, now you have to integrate into the new company. One of the things we liked about the new company was they said, look, the way you guys invest money for your clients, keep doing it that way. We're not going to make you change to like this way or that way or that. There's so many different ways to invest money. Every, every company they buy, they let them continue to do what they do because you've had success. You've had so much success that we wanted to buy you. We want you to keep doing it with the same people. So, um, and I'm skipping so much detail that there's so much involved in what that really means and how it all works and how we track that. But um, integrations can be a nightmare. So we wanted to make sure we did a transaction that had as little integration as possible. It only changed two uh, systems from for us. Um, we moved to a new CRM system and we knew, moved to a new portfolio management platform. It's kind of how you keep the accounting of all the client portfolios. Um, really difficult to make a change like that. The CRM was a pain in the neck, but we did it. Moving the client, port, we've done it a couple of times. We changed vendors and it's just a nightmare, but finally got done took about a year. Literally took a year to get over on their platform. Once you're on their platform, then you can see, then they can see exactly, um, you know, right to the minute, you know, what you're tracking and what clients, you know, what, what new clients coming on board and all that stuff. So the integrations were difficult, but um, not impossible. We've heard horror stories. But the other integration is you're integrating your employees and you're integrating your clients because some things are changing. Some things look different. You know, some, the client report you're going to get doesn't say bank anymore. You're getting a bank report for 30 years. Now it's going to say it's already partners. And, event, and the colors change, you know, the color scheme. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but, you know, clients get comfortable with you. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, your branding has changed. Who are you? Um, so you have to like make sure that all went well. Employees, the hard one. The employees took a long time to integrate. So the story was great. We thought it was going to happen like this. It really happened sort of like that, but sort of like this. It was all very messy. And if I had to criticize Saturday Partners, is that I think it's still trying to figure out the best way to integrate employees onto the platform because they're making so many acquisitions, it's hard to keep up with, right? So they're doing it much better now. We actually started helping because every time we make an acquisition, then you help with the next one because you can give them advice on, hey, this is what happened. They, they forgot to tell me this, but this is what actually happened, you know, because they flipped through the cracks. So it's getting better and better in that regard. But we found a lot of our employees found the integration to be difficult, even though it kept the same office, same everything. Although we were home from COVID, that's why that was another reason why nothing changed. They were still in their pajamas on Zoom and nothing really changed. From, they didn't, you know, suddenly go in and it was different, uh, you know, different people and a new, a new boss and everything. It was sort of the same thing for them. And then trying to figure out what the rest of the company was doing while you're home during COVID, it's kind of hard to get to know other people. You know, they didn't come and they, oh, by the way, let me back up. It wasn't until October that the buyer said, we have to come see you. By October, they would have already seen us a couple of times in Boston. We would have been to Chicago a couple of times and flying to New York. We would have been meeting a lot of people. We did all that by Zoom. 
right? Very unusual. And finally, they said, we got to push the tires, make sure you're real. We're going to make sure, like, are you real people, you know? And um, so we had to use COVID protocol. They show up with masks on. We had masks. It was so, so hard to meet people like that. You know, you're trying to make an impression where I don't want you to see what we're really doing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Sam, that night we had meetings all day in the office. Our employees weren't there, so it was good. They didn't know it was happening at this point yet. Sam had a big party for them in his bar, right? His bar. What, what, what do you conjure up when you think of a party in a bar? I think like, you know, square dancing and kind of big. Um, his barn, part of his barn has um, Porsche and all sorts of, you know, Corvettes and classic cars. He, he collects classic cars and it's beautiful, so expensive. And then there's a whole area where, you know, there used to be horses and stuff, but no longer. Um, and he had this big long table and it's catered by this great company. And they came and we came and we kind of broke bread together. And it was just so nice actually having these, you know, for the first time having a real face-to-face you know, talk with these people and really understand some of your kids, you know, what do you like to do? Do you ski, do you play golf, whatever? And it was such a turning point for the relationship. And that's sort of Bill Belichick said, you can do tons of stuff on social media and Zoom. And so you really meet people face to face. It's a different thing. It really is a different thing. And I, I know I keep, you know, kind of jamming the point home and I don't mean to sound like I'm lecturing you on it, but it's easy to lose sight of that because it is easy to stay home. Uh, I found it easier. I found like, oh, once it was time to go back to the office, I was like, yeah, I train, I don't want to train anymore. And it stinks. You know, there are masks on the train, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's down. It's like it becomes easy to seclude yourself. So um, that's what technology has done for all of us, right? And probably the younger you are, the more you're you're kind of exposed to it, right? You guys, you guys grew up with this. Uh, I, I learned it. You know, Tom learned it. But, you know, um, just be careful. Just be careful that you're not missing out on opportunities to really get to know people face to face. You know, um, let me tell you about me really fast before I go on, and I'm going to wrap up in just a couple of minutes. Um, I say I volunteered not to stay on. So I spent uh, about 23 years working at Banco, seven in commercial real estate, five with my family, and then 23 years in commercial real estate. And uh, by the way, going back to your point about something else, is you know if I went, if I didn't take that interview with Banco. And I took the job at the commercial real estate place, which I thought was my destiny. I thought, oh, that's what I should do once I stop working with my family, just get back on track. I'm so glad I didn't do it. Um, I might have been really successful. I don't know. But I love what the last 23 years gave me a think of that opportunity. So again, don't get too caught up in, I was focused on this and I didn't get it. Now everything is falling apart, you know? Don't worry. <clears throat> it's always something else. There's probably 10 other things, right? And you may not see it that day. It may take a while, but you'll get to it. So don't get all uptight about not getting what you thought you really wanted or really needed or what was perfect for you. Nothing's perfect for you, okay? You're going to end up going in a certain direction based on 100 different factors. And you're going to make the best of it, and you'll be successful if you do all those things that we're talking about, right? So anyways, that was kind of an aside. I was working for 23 years with Sam. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was a very difficult 23 years. Um, when I took the job, my, I have three kids, wife and three kids. My daughter uh, was a month from being born. Sounds funny. I had two boys and my daughter was, uh, had not been born yet. A month later after I started Banco, she was born. I don't know why that came out really difficult. <laughs> um, so young family, it's hard. You know, I was taking a train to Boston every day. It was about an hour and 15 minute commute each way. Um, it's hard, you know, my wife uh, did choose to stay at home, so it made it easier for us to do that. But because she stayed at home as a full-time mom, that was hard on the finances too. I wasn't making, early on, I wasn't making a ton of money. I was making okay money, but, you know, one income family, we weren't paying for daycare, but, you know, that was it. She wasn't making any money. So it was difficult. I was away. I was gone all, all week. The good thing was rarely did I have to work weekends. And that was really good. Some nights I was there very late and so forth. Um, I told him a little bit about Sam. He's a hard guy to work for. He's a good human being. I'm not, I'm not trashing him. He's a hard guy to work for. Um, when I get into the, maybe I should just jump to that, um, that page on entrepreneurs. Sorry to be kind of breaking this up a little bit, but I think you'll get it. We talked about integration, retaining clients, multi-year earnouts, challenges throughout, confidentiality was important, uh, a few doing work of many. Uncertainty around the elections. I kind of talked about that a little bit earlier too. Uh, the potential for increase in capital gains didn't happen. 
market volatility. Okay, that's it. Look, the entrepreneur, one slide. The psychology is communicating with the entrepreneurs, their unique breed. This is my wording, by the way, but I think most people would agree you know entrepreneurs. They kind of have a type A personality. They work around the clock. They're just fully dedicated to what they do. Oops. Um, Hardworking, committed to their cause, high expectations of themselves and of others. They're frequently disappointed. You can never do enough. You never fully satisfy them. Whatever you do is like, ah, sometimes it's like, oh, that was great. Uh, but how about doing always more? They're always trying to squeeze every drop out of everything, right? Um, they think outside the box. That's kind of what makes them so unique. They can think in a way that most people don't. Most people follow the herd. They can think outside the box. The visionaries, they see the world as it could be, not the way it is, right? They see people, you know, you create Apple because I, I see the, you know, the world of communication being very different than it is right now. And that's why Apple was created. They don't think the rules apply to them, right? Kind of like you're a kid, you're, you're, your kid is misbehaves and it's like, no, 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 I'm going to do it my way, right? They can kind of be like that. These are these are people who are driven. They say, no, I don't care about the this way is the right way. I know it's right. You know, they need to be reeled back in sometimes. Oops, went too far. Need to be reeled back in sometimes. That's a big one. That kind of takes you back to me. I'm I'm one of the people, and probably the most often in the 23 years, I had a real Sam back. You know, and it was draining on me. And again, Sam is not. He doesn't break laws. He doesn't. You know, he doesn't treat people badly on purpose, right? <laughs> But there's a certain way that um, he doesn't know what he's doing, like when he's kind of talking a certain way to somebody. Um, so, you know, I was, I was really in the back and saying, hey, Sam, I got to do this way. And there's a lot of conversations, a lot of arguing, a lot of fights. There's a few fights where we raise our voices a lot. Um, a few times we had to go back and apologize to each other. I mean, and honestly, the first time Sam apologized to me was uh, 2018. Wow. 2018. So I remember what I was doing when we were doing it, and we had a really blowout fight. And he said a couple of things to me that he didn't mean. And I knew he didn't mean it, but it was really awful. It was, it was the, you know, you're, we all do it. I mean, we get really upset and we say things we don't mean to we're angry, right? Two hours later, he called me on a bottle and he gave me a full apology. I never heard him apologize in my life, right? Because he doesn't think he does anything wrong, right? And again, he's a good human being. I'm not saying he's not. But it's very tiring and it wore on me. And my kids grew up and my kids are great. I have a 28 year old, 26 year old, 23 year old. They call it all around here. Your age is um, pretty close. Um, we survived it all. It was all great and everything. I knew what my payout was going to be when we sold the company. And it was not that I could retire early at 57 years old. And I'm very thankful for that. I feel like I was in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of deserving people out there of what I got um, that didn't get it. And maybe just because of being in the right place at the right time and you know, being around the right people, you know, things like you know, the stars are all aligned for it, whatever reason it is. So I feel very blessed. I feel um, uh, incredibly lucky that I could um, still be a young age where I still have my health and so forth, not good, not blessed, but, um, that I can retire and spend more time with my family, my wife, and travel and do things like this, you know, which are kind of fun. And, um, and so I said, look, when, and I knew this was going to happen because I was the exit planning guy. So I know that when companies get bought, the people who don't keep their jobs is usually the CFO, the CFO, because the company that bought us has a CFO, a COO, a head of HR, a legal person. It, every category that I was taking care of, technology, the whole technology department, like everything that I was like the in-house expert on, they kind of had someone running it, right? And they were great. And I'm not putting myself on that. I, I couldn't step in and do anything they were doing, right? No, I take that back. I couldn't step into all those roles. I could step in their CFO role the CFO, and do it just as well or better than they're doing it. So I had no, no problem with my, my core. But I said to myself, you know what? They're probably not going to really need me. And what they said was, everyone keeps their job. You want a job, Mark, you can have a job. And I said to myself, yeah, I did, didn't even entertain it because I'm not sure why. I can't tell you why. I couldn't see myself in the structure that they had based on who I was, what my skill sets were, uh, are, um, what I believe in, sort of starting all over. I think I was just too tired. I was worn out. I was burnt out. And I said, you know, this was a perfect time to say, just step back, help out the transition, but step back. And so what happened with me was 
I got to negotiate not only the shares I got, but a really nice buyout of my contract as well. And so I got extra money for doing that. In return, I still stay on for during these three years, you're not, I'll keep running Vanco. I have to keep the lights on a Vanco sort of thing because you have to kind of finish the, you know, cross the teeth and dot in the eyes. Um, and I'll help with integration to transition. And so they kept me on. They actually put me on, um, continued my salary for another year and a half. And then I said, can done. And they kept me on benefits as a favor. And I said, okay, you have benefits for a little while longer. Look, I'm still on right now. Um, I'll work like one day a week, one day every time. So keep using me. Call me when you need me and I'll be there. I'll keep handling this and this and this. And it's worked out really, really well. So I actually got a really good deal for stepping back. Um, all of life is really important to me. And I bet it's important to every single person in this room. And I'm guessing none of you are thinking about retirement right now. Um, not that you should be thinking about retirement today, but as you progress with your careers and understanding where you're going and where your careers are taking you, you know, spend a lot of time as you kind of get to that maturity level. And I don't know what age, there's no magic age, but probably when you're in your 40s, maybe you start to think about where is this taking me? What do I want to do? Do I want to think about starting a family with kids? You know, whatever it is, um, is this enriching my life? The question you have to keep asking yourself, is this enriching my life? And I didn't think that um, moving on, moving ahead with a full-time job with them was going to enrich my life anymore. In fact, I thought that uh, enriching my life for me was doing all those things that I really want to do. Spending time with my friends. I play music. Do you ever music? I both play music, but we'll skip over that right now. But <laughs> I still play. I still play music with a couple of buddies that I grew up with, and we play. I play in a band, and that's so much fun. We still do that on a regular basis. And um, my wife and I travel. I help my kids out. Yeah, they're they're adults, but they're not really adults. And I'm, I'm not trashing you guys, but <laughs> they're adults. But you know, they still they're my kids, and um, they need a lot of help sometimes. And I love helping them. I love. I love that they have all gotten to the point where they actually come to me for advice. And my oldest loves talking to me. He's great. He's like so so easy, right? The other two are quiet, right? But my middle, he's a musician, and he's having a really hard time getting a career off the ground because the music business is very difficult. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so he kind of got the maturity level finally about a year or two ago, where he actually started calling me and saying, "You know, can we talk?" You know, which is great. My daughter, she's difficult and she's an artist, by the way, but she's got a day job and she's an artist and struggling and she's tough and she'll never admit that she needs my help. Um, I give her a lot of help, but she kind of hasn't grown up to that, you know, kind of trusting thing like, hey, Dad, can I ask, ask for some help? Um, you know, kids change, kids evolve, but I love, I love helping them. Um, and sometimes it's really difficult because seeing your kids struggle, even though you know it's a necessity, sometimes it's hard. And you guys are all, are struggling, have struggled, there's, there's no doubt about it. Y'all came with good grades, and that's great. But I think some days, some of you said, you, know, you came with a two or a three or you know, maybe a five or a six. It's career-wise and personal-wise, things don't always happen the way you want them to happen, right? So it's not your situation, it's how you respond to your situation. Um, I wish I could remember his name, but there's a famous guy who was in the concentration, the Nazi concentration camps, and he did a lot of writing and, and uh, philosophizing over the years. He, he was, um, he said that, um, um, the, uh, losing the, the, the words he used, but the, um, the give and take when something happens to you and you respond to it, right? Your response to something, something bad that's happening. The time in between whatever happens to you that was bad and the time you react and respond to it is power. It's power. And this is a guy coming from the conservation. Right? So what he's saying is, it's up to you to react and respond to things that don't go wrong. And you can just lose your temper right away, react, respond, flap the handle, you know, walk out, I'm quitting, I'm doing whatever it is, you know, I'm breaking up with you. Um, if you do that, you're probably not doing that with any kind of power because you really haven't thought it through. You haven't really thought through how you could really get out of this in the best possible way you can. So there's power in that silence, there's power in that gap. So remember that every time something personal or professional starts to kind of hit you guys, it's going to happen professionally. I know that. It's going to happen personally too. I mean, we've all had our share, right? Um, I only told you the good stuff. I didn't tell you the bad stuff, right? It's a lot of bad stuff too. That's really difficult, more than what I'm saying, right? It happens in every company, happens in every relationship, right? So try to kind of take heed. 
and try to um, not give up every time something bad happens. Because once you get through this bad thing, another bad thing is going to happen. That's one thing I can guarantee you of. And sometimes it's even worse the next time. But the more you learn to react to it and respond to it, right? The more you learn to rely on other people, you know, kind of build that relationship team around you, both professionally and personally, when bad things happen, you start to develop a team that can help you out of it. I know it sounds goofy. It sounds like everything you see on you know, you need social media. I swear to God, it works. It does work. If you have faith, you guys have any kind of, whatever your faith is, it's a great thing to turn to me. You just need to build something around you in your life that will help you respond to and react to the most difficult time in life. So I'm going to end it there and say, any questions? We have about 10 minutes. Any questions? Any follow-up? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask you, was it easier to get into the market of IPO or was it easier to get exit out of the IPO? In our situation yeah. or in general? So was it easier or more difficult for you? Oh, for me personally. Yeah. Oh, personally, it was a, um, personally, it was hard. Because you know I said Sam had became his identity? I mean, for 23 years, it's a long time too. It's like I'm watching my kids grow up. Like my daughter was there and there when I first started working there. So yeah, um, your work does become your identity to some extent, but you can't let it change your life and rule your life, right? So I felt personally it was difficult making that. You know, that next day on January first, it was a good day off, of course. But I felt weird that day. I said, "Boy, I, I, I'm not part of the anchor anymore." Whoa, this is weird. <laughs> Sam must have felt freaked out. Like, no, he's doing 34 years, so it's all right. So. Um. So I have a question regarding your customer acquisition at Banco. So I know you were maybe more on the financial side, but I'm curious, you know, Banco being um, a company that valued and, and their biggest strength was in that relationship building that they were, that you, you know, you mentioned a, a ton. Um, I was curious, you know, on the marketing side, the branding side, just the, the customer acquisition side, you know, how did, how did that kind of relationship building, how did, how did the marketing reflect that? How, how, how did the customer acquisition reflect the, the your biggest strength piece of the so uh, our ability to bring new clients on board and sign them onto the platform that you're saying how did that uh, yes yes but 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 if, if there was you know if that process um was representative of the uh relationship strength that you guys had at Banco. yeah no um good question we we um so when we were in prospect meetings and we've all done them. I brought some money and I brought like three clients worth about 20 million over the years. So that's not a lot. You know, the other people are client phase and bringing a lot of assets. So we're all involved in these client meetings to some extent, help out with marketing materials, whatever it is. And we pitch the relationship. We do. We pitch that this is what we do for our clients. It's not just about, you know, we're going to tell you all about the research we do, the stock portfolio, you know, how we do asset allocation. We're going to give you the whole thing. But the reason you're going to love us more than the next guy. Mm -hmm. is those are fine and everything but what distinguishes us is being a team of people who will care about you and your family and their family generations to come we're going to think about everything we do about you and your family and about generationally how your assets can move down to the next you know whether they, what tax repercussions of that we want to move it down seamlessly and so forth um we sell that all market materials are geared for geared towards the relationship I mean, that's, that's the distinguishing factor. Because honestly, we did a good job investing. Our results were good. Fidelity's results are good. Morgan Stanley's results are good. Right? Everyone has good results. Honestly, none of these big companies really screw up. They shouldn't be screwing up your portfolio. There's too much technology that kind of helps you stay in line with the market, okay? Things that distinguish you is that personal intention. Like, what do you do differently than everyone else? Well, the other ones are going to call you once a year. They're going to send you your portfolio every quarter. They're going to bill you. They're going to quickly bill you every quarter. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to have meetings with you. We have like a whole um, a whole process around the number of meetings we have with the number of clients that we have face to face or on the phone with the family, with the spouse, whatever it was. And so, yeah, we marketed it toward the relationship. That was the distinguishing factor. Thank you. Yeah. We're, all right, should we wrap up? Yeah, I'm going to wrap up with something that I think is sort of fun here. Bear with me. 